I now call to order the Society's 2,422nd meeting in the 149th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Melstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Rajesh Rao being broadcast to you via Zoom and YouTube. Now, for those of you who are new to PSW Science, a bit of explanation may be helpful. This broadcast is of the entire meeting of the society tonight, including preliminary and closing presentations before and following the lecture. The lecture itself will not begin for about 15 minutes from now. If this part of the program is not of interest, sit back, relax, and just be a little bit patient. Thanks. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2421st meeting and the 89th Joseph Henry Lecture by Shep Dolman, Michael Johnson, and Andy Strominger on the Event Horizon Telescope and the first images of a black hole. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. When the Q&A session is done, I will thank our speaker, then make a few closing announcements, thank those who make PSW possible, and adjourn the meeting to your private social hours. Please note that all questions are fielded during the Q&A after the lecture. There are three ways to ask questions. If you're a Zoom attendee, you can ask the question over your own microphone. To do so, you have to raise your Zoom hand and be recognized. And when I call on you, we will unmute you and you will be able to speak and we will be able to hear your question. If you're a Zoom attendee, you may also ask questions by text in the Zoom Q&A channel. And if you're watching by YouTube, you too can ask questions by text using the YouTube chat facility adjacent to the live stream video. I will re repeat this information later on. Now, please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2019-2020 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a generous donor who asked to remain anonymous. I'm sure you're all thanking them and cheering at home. Please also join me in thanking the sponsor of tonight's lecture, PSW member Adarsh Deepak. Adarsh, if you're there, wherever you are, I know you travel widely. All of PSW and all of the viewers, thank you for your kind and generous support of the society. I am pleased to announce the following new members have been elected to the society. Zbigniew Sagan, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer with Advanced Track and Trace, who has wide ranging interests in various aspects of science and who learned about PSW while he was looking for lectures by Nima Arkani Hamed. And having found one on our website was struck by the as you put it, quality of BSW lectures. Thank you. Zbigniew is located in France. He promised he'd be watching, and so we have a nice greeting for you, Zbigniew, and hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. Also, Pierre Cartier, a dentist with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs with broad interests in health sciences and public health policy. Pierre is a returning member 
Welcome back, Pierre. And tonight's speaker, Rajesh Rao, whose background and interest will be clear to you in part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. Recording Secretary James Hewlin will now read the minutes of the 2,421st meeting and the annual Joseph Emery Lecture by Shep Dolman, Michael Johnson, and Andy Strominger on the event Horizon Telescope and the first image of a black hole delivered to the Society by Zoom and YouTube on May 15, 2020. James, Thank you, Larry. The podium is yours. Well, actually, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. On May 15, 2020, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 89th Joseph Henry Lecture and 2,421st meeting of the Society to order at 8.03 p.m. EDT. He announced the order of business that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet and welcomed new members to the Society. The recording secretary then read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein introduced the speakers for the evening. Shepard Dolman, founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope and an astrophysicist at the Center for Astrophysics of Harvard University and the Smithsonian Institution. Michael Johnson, a Smithsonian astrophysicist who co-led the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Team. And Andrew Storminger, the York Professor of Physics and Director of the Center for the Fundamental Laws of Nature at Harvard University. Collectively, the lecture was titled, The Event Horizon Telescope, First Ever Images of a Black Hole. Dolman opened the lecture, explaining that a black hole is matter condensed into a small enough volume that, at its edge, gravity is so strong the matter collapses in on itself and creates an event horizon, beyond which not even light can escape. Dolman then explained how the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, captured the first image of a black hole. Einstein's theories of gravity predicted the existence of black holes, and in recent years, Scientists have been able to use computer technology to simulate them. These simulations produced asymmetrical shadowy spheres with light bent around dark centers, creating a photon ring whose diameters are the square root of 27 multiplied by the Schwarzschild radius, just as Max van Loo predicted in 1921. For years, scientists have identified back-to-back light-years-long jets of gas at which they believed black holes were the center. EHT considered two such objects, Sagittarius, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and M87, a black hole at the center of the Virgo A galaxy. The EHT team believed that viewing a black hole at extremely short wavelengths would reveal shadowy spheres at their centers. EHT predicted M87's shadowy sphere was 50 micro arc seconds across. To see that sphere would require a radio wave telescope 10,000 kilometers across. To accomplish this feat, the EHT used short wavelength, very long baseline interferometry, or VLBI, which splits the telescope into two pieces located on opposite ends of the Earth, equipped with atomic clocks that precisely tag data which is recorded onto hard disks and compared. This technique mimics a radio telescope with a dish the distance between the two telescopes. The EHT currently comprises eight telescopes and will be expanding to 11 total. Each pair of telescopes gives the EHT additional data points as the Earth rotates. And for four days in 2017, EHT focused its array on M87. To avoid groupthink, the team then split into four groups to independently image the data. Each team's final image showed an asymmetrical ring-like structure with a photon orbit. Dolman explained how the team reconciled their methods to conclude M87 as a 6.5 billion solar mass black hole. This measurement is consistent with measurements predicted by general relativity, the Kerr hypothesis, and stellar dynamics measurement. By adding telescopes around the Earth and potentially in Earth orbit, 
Dolman said the next-gen EHT will be able to see how black holes connect to and how they power the jets that launch. He said they may be able to do so in movie-like resolution. Michael Johnson spoke next on analysis of M87's photon ring. Black holes are defined by only two measures, he said, their size and spin. Johnson said this information is encoded in the spherical photon orbits that create the photon ring. He said if the team could unwrap the photon ring, they could see a tomographic probe of the three-dimensional distribution of the emitting material in the space-time close to the event horizon. The photon ring is actually a stack of subrings, and each subring is indexed by photon orbits around the black hole. By looking at emission profiles as a function of distance from the black hole's center, peaks of emission are revealed corresponding with each subring. The subrings give a strong interferometric signatures on long basin lines, which can be measured with a single pair of telescopes measuring at different frequencies. Viewing subrings at very long baselines allows scientists to decouple relativistic effects from astrophysical effects. Such viewing will improve by adding telescopes to the EHT. Andrew Strominger then spoke on the quantum information paradox and how work on the paradox has dovetailed with EHT imaging. Classically, a black hole is the simplest object in the universe, an empty space with nothing inside its edge. Anything crossing the horizon dissolves into nothingness. But in 1974, Stephen Hawking applied the uncertainty principle to black holes and showed they radiate. The temperature of the Hawking radiation is a function of the black hole's mass. This relationship should allow scientists to infer the number of gigabytes in a black hole in what Strominger described as a very fundamental and very mysterious formula. He said all the information in Google's data banks could fit in a black hole measuring 10 to the negative 24th millimeters, making them the most complex possible objects in the physical universe. Further concerning scientists, he said, is that black holes appear to lose information as they radiate. String theory uses conformal symmetry to reconcile this paradox of how the simplest object could also be the most complex. And while string theory is not proven, the EHT image shows in principle conformal symmetry around the edge of M87. Johnson is optimistic the conformal symmetry will be confirmed as the EHT is able to image black holes with greater resolution. The three speakers then took questions from the online audience. One Zoom viewer asked whether CubeSats could be used for a next-gen EHT. Dolman said the satellites would likely need to be bigger than CubeSats, requiring space antennae of at least two to three meters in diameter, preferably larger. He believes the EHT can piggyback on existing missions. A member viewing through Zoom asked whether all black holes have photon rings. Johnson answered affirmatively, explaining that photon rings scale according to a black hole's size. After an engaging question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speakers, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 10.21 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 28 degrees C. Weather clear. Viewing through the live stream on Zoom, 54, and on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 89. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. We have one comment that came in on the YouTube channel from John Garavelli, a PSW member. And he wanted to point out that it's not Sagittarius, it's Sagittarius A. Ah, thank you. I'll make the note. If any others have corrections on the minutes, please email them within 48 hours to corresponding secretary Robin Taylor. And uh, they will be attended to uh, after 48 hours and attending to corrections, the minutes will be posted to the website. Thank you very much, James. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, let me just repeat again the procedure for questions. 
And that is, uh, there are three ways to ask questions. You can ask if you're a Zoom participant directly using your own microphone by raising your Zoom hand and being called on and then we'll unmute your mic. So you can ask your question. You can ask also if you're a Zoom participant by using the Zoom Q&A and entering text. And if you are watching by YouTube, you can use the YouTube chat to ask a question again by text. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Rajesh Rao, and the lecture on when AI joins the human brain, brain co-processors for restoring and augmenting human function. Rajesh is the Jia and Wang Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and co-director of the NSF Center for Neurotechnology at the University of Washington, Seattle. Rajesh has done pioneering research in computational neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and brain-computer interfacing. He and his colleagues were the first to demonstrate direct human brain control of a humanoid robot, direct brain-to-brain -brain communication in humans, and three directly communicating human brains forming a brain net. Rajesh is an author on more than 200 articles on his research. He authored the authoritative text, Brain Computer Interfacing, and is co-editor of two other important texts, Probabilistic Models of the Brain and Bayesian Brain. In addition, he and Adrian Fairhall offered the first massively online open course in computational neuroscience. Among other honors and awards, Rajesh is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Fulbright Scholar Award, an NSF Career Award, a Young Investigator Award from the Office of Naval Research, a Sloan Faculty Fellowship, and a Packard Fellowship for Science and Engineering. In addition, Rajesh is actively interested in classical Indian paintings and in the 4,000-year-old, as yet undeciphered, Indus script. His TED Talk on this topic has had over 2 million views. We hope that tonight's PSW talk will reach a good many people, maybe not that many. And he earned his PhD at the University of Rock, <coughs> excuse me, Rochester. Rajesh, please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture. Please join me in welcoming Rajesh to the screen. Rajesh. Yes. It's all yours. All right. Um, let me share my screen so we can begin. All right. Can you uh, see my title slide? We're good. All right. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Larry. And uh, thanks also to uh, PSW for inviting me. And special thanks to uh, PSW member Adarsh uh, Deepak uh, for sponsoring uh, my talk. Um, I wish I could. Uh, I could have actually come there to meet all of you. Uh, you know. Um, I'm here on the, uh, in the other Washington, uh, the Washington State here in Seattle, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, we, I could take a rain check and, you know, or maybe should it should be a pandemic check to, to, uh, to visit you all uh, when, when things subside. So You have a rain check. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so great. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, and what I'll do today is uh, give you a, uh, an overview of some of the research uh, that uh, my lab is pursuing and also uh, uh, the Center for Neurotechnology, which I direct. Uh, is pursuing. And uh, the title, um, as you can see, has to do with uh, restoring and augmenting human function using what we're calling uh, brain coprocessors. So uh, let's begin with a, a, a thought experiment. So uh, here's kind of the big picture that we have in mind, which is uh, what are the possibilities that open up when you uh, essentially connect directly a computer or a processing device uh, to the human brain? Uh, and particularly, the computer is implementing uh, some type of artificial intelligence. And so the question is, what can we do with this kind of a, of a device? Uh, if it's possible, um, you know, it, what kinds of 
uh, possibilities does it open up uh, for uh, for human uh, for human existence, right? So, uh, for as an example, I mean, let's look at three examples. The first one is: you know, can we imagine enhancing our human abilities with something like a brain-controlled robotic suit, right? And so, and and probably when I mentioned that, you you already have. Uh, imagined uh, something that Hollywood has done. This is basically the premise of Iron Man, right? So uh, the idea of enhancing the physical capabilities of, of humans has already been explored and it leads to some interesting, uh, you know, Hollywood stories. But uh, for us at the Center for Newer Technology, what we're interested in is uh, the question, can we, for example, build a brain controlled robotic arm for someone who is paralyzed? Uh, and that's a very important uh, engineering and scientific question that we're trying to address and that other groups also in this area of neural engineering and brain machine interfaces is trying to address. Uh, a second uh, possibility, if you uh, think about what one could do if we can have computers and brains interacting with each other, is you know, can we learn a new skill by essentially downloading it right, to our brains? I mean, this seems again, uh, like something right straight out of science fiction. And, and indeed, uh, if you recall the uh, movie Matrix, uh, the principal character there, Neo, does exactly that. So by downloading the uh, skill uh, for Kung Fu right, directly into his brain. Well, we're not interested in learning Kung Fu like that. We, we, uh, what we're interested in is uh, actually using that same capacity of rewiring the brain uh, using a computer uh, to restore movement uh, in a stroke patient. Uh, so can we do that? Can we actually use a computer to redirect connections or redirect information in the brain to help somebody who's paralyzed uh, due to stroke. Uh, and finally, uh, what about conveying thoughts telepathically, right? This is again being a dream, a science fiction dream, right? So can we convey thoughts telepathically? Can we influence other minds? And as you might have guessed, uh, there's a Hollywood version of that or many versions of that, which is and in this case, uh, for example, uh, Professor X, right? In, in the, in the X-Men movies is able to communicate directly with the char other characters uh, in the movie. Uh, so can we do something like that? And can we do something like that right now with the kind of devices we have for interacting uh, with the brain? Uh, so we're, we're actually uh, right now in the process of um, exploring some of these questions, but we're doing it using a device that we uh, call a brain coprocessor. So a brain coprocessor is uh, a device, a computer essentially, that uses artificial intelligence or AI to interact directly with the brain. And we're doing that because we wanna help people, for example, people who are paralyzed, uh, enable them to control prosthetic devices, uh, use this kind of a, a co-processor for the brain to uh, have very targeted rehabilitation for somebody who might have suffered from stroke. Uh, and similarly also, uh, if you think about the kinds of possibilities that this opens up, you know, could we help people who might have neuropsychiatric conditions like depression or PTSD? Um, so the possibilities for helping people uh, are endless, essentially. And so at the Center for Neurotechnology, which uh, I direct at the uh, University of Washington, we're looking at this new concept of a bra brain coprocessor, uh, looking at how we can build these devices, how can we test these devices, how can we eventually uh, make these devices available uh, for people who could uh, benefit from them. So let's look at some of the components of a brain coprocessor. What do we need in order to build these types of devices, right? So first of all, uh, let me get my uh, pointer here so it'll make it easier. So, uh, so first, you, you need some way of reading brain signals. So that's uh, this arrow here uh, pointing to neural recordings. And you also want to be able to write back to the brain information that you obtain after processing. So essentially you have the brain coprocessor receiving information from the brain as well as sending information back to the brain after processing it in some way. And that's where the AI comes in. Uh, at the same time, there may also be cases where you might want to include some information from an external information source. So, so let's think about that. So what, what kinds of information could uh, a brain coprocessor use in order to, uh, for example, benefit the brain directly? So, if you think about it, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, for example, visual impairment, uh, potentially one could build a brain coprocessor for the blind. And in that case, you could use a camera as an external information source that is then uh, used, the inputs are used by the brain coprocessor and the images are then translated into some stimulation signals uh, for the brain. And those 
uh, signals are then enabling the person potentially to see the images uh, from the camera. Similarly, there's uh, the output, which could uh, not just go directly to the brain, uh, but there could also be, for example, an output going to an external actuator or a robot, for example. And in this case, you could have signals from the brain that convey the intention of the person and that inter intention of the person to, for example, move a robotic prosthetic hand to pick up a cup of water, for example, could be processed using AI. And, and that information could then be used to control an external robotic prosthetic um, hand or robotic prosthetic arm. Uh, and that's an example of an output that, could, that, that you could have from a, a brain coprocessor. And uh, if, uh, you can also imagine the output being something beyond just a robotic device. It could even be just a computer. So for example, you could be controlling a cursor on a computer screen, or you could be uh, sending information to the internet to do browsing, for example, or, or, or getting information from the internet. And then that information is conveyed back to the inputs, and then that's fed directly to the brain. So there's lots of different possibilities that this particular architecture opens up if it is possible to do this uh, using technologies that we have today. And so the bottom line is uh, when you have a brain cool processor like this, what it enables you to do is it, it's essentially enabling a direct interaction between some kind of artificial intelligence, some program uh, that is implemented in the cool processor, and it's directly interacting with the brain. So that's kind of the big picture that we have in mind. It also speaks to this tagline that we had about uh, you know, AI joining the brain or AI meets the brain. All right, so the, uh, some of the prerequisites here are, you know, first of all, you need to be able to read and write the brain if we really are going to build these cool processors. And so there's several different technologies that we're exploring uh, in my lab and at the center. So for example, you could use something called EEG or electroencephalography. And this is a very classic technique uh, that uh, is, has been used for a very long time actually in hospitals to diagnose sleep disorders. But in this case, uh, what we're doing is recording very tiny electrical fluctuations from the scalp. Uh, the, the scalp is able to convey, in this case, the uh, activities that are being generated by very, very large populations of neurons, uh, brain cells that are in the brain, but then that signal is then aggregated average over and eventually it gets recorded by electrodes, these wires that are recording uh, electrical fluctuations at the level of the scalp. And those in turn are then amplified and used uh, by the computer to then uh, decode, for example, the intention of a person. We'll see some examples of that uh, quite soon. Um, the second way that we're, uh, we can record from the brain is a little bit more invasive. So uh, in this case, you're recording from the surface of the brain and you might ask, okay, who would really opt for this kind of a recording or stimulation um, methodology? So this we are doing only in the hospital for patients who are uh, going into brain surgery uh, or if you wanna monitor their brain for seizures. Uh, these are the kinds of um, signals you would get uh, as the person is in the hospital, uh, on the hospital bed. And you can see that in this case, the signals are being recorded not from the scalp, but from the surface of the brain. So you might have an array, each of these white circles is one electrode. And that each of these one, one electrode uh, might record from several hundreds of thousands of neurons uh, that are lying underneath that particular location. So what you get out of this is the aggregated activity of many, many large populations of neurons. And you can also use this technology to deliver electrical currents at these locations on the surface of the brain. And uh, in, by doing that, we're able to then send information or write information back to the brain. So we'll look at some examples of that also. And finally, uh, the, the most uh, high resolution way of getting, uh, in, uh, actually sending information into the brain or recording information from the brain is to use something called microelectrodes. And these are devices that are shown on the right-hand side here. You can see the scale compared to a, uh, a thumbnail, and you can see that these electrodes uh, are some are implanted inside the brain, so they penetrate the brain, and and the and they attempt to record from individual neurons, individual brain cells uh, that are in that particular location that this uh, this array, this array of electrodes is implanted, uh, which are like location is implanted in. So you can see here that you, we span the uh, range of. Um, uh, recording te uh, technologies here, ranging from non-invasive technologies like EEG to recording from the brain surface called ECOG or electrocorticography, 
And finally, uh, recording from individual neurons inside the brain using the technology of microelectrodes. All right, so let's look at some examples of, of these, um, uh, what these recording technologies give us uh, when you record from them. So let's look at EEG, right? So uh, EEG, as, you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, records from the surface of the head, from the scalp. So um, when you actually uh, came into um, the Zoom session, uh, perhaps you were very alert, and so you might have had uh, your EEG signals that looked something like this. So this is, these are called beta waves, so, so somewhat higher frequency oscillations going up and down at some particular frequency. And these typically uh, correspond to the brain state of alertness. And so EEG is indicating something about the overall brain state at that particular point in time. Now, um, if, if my voice is sounding like, you know, it's, it's droning on and on, and maybe you're feeling a little relaxed and so on, so uh, maybe you had, some, had, a, had a big meal, then you might have actually started to get into this position of relaxation. So you're, you're leaning back on your chair, and you enter into this uh, mode of alpha waves. So your brain is now oscillating now at a, uh, a lower frequency, as you can see, and that corresponds to alpha waves uh, or lower frequency waves uh, that you see in EEG. And this corresponds to you being relaxed and you know, um, uh, uh, I guess not as paying as much attention. And I really hope that uh, nobody is in this particular state. This corresponds to deep sleep, right? So this is basically delta waves. And the delta waves indicate uh, the, uh, what, what your brain uh, state is when you're actually in deep sleep. Um, so as you can see, EEG conveys very sort of coarse level information, uh, not individual brain cells or neurons, but the aggregated activity of many, many uh, hundreds of thousands of neurons. Uh, but it's still useful in the sense that it does give you some indication about overall uh, brain state, what the brain is, is engaged in right now. Um, let's look at uh, ECOG or electrocardiography. Uh, these are recordings from the surface uh, of the brain. And uh, electrocardiography, as you can imagine, is, uh, is better than EEG in the sense that it's closer to the brain, closer to where the action is, closer to where neurons are, are, be, are be becoming activated. And so uh, what you get out of uh, ECOG are uh, signals that look like this. So for example, if we ask a person to rest, um, then you might have uh, this kind of, uh, as shown in the green, you can see, again, signals that are oscillating, going up and down uh, at some particular frequency. But when you ask them to make a movement, such as a hand movement, so they might be opening and closing their hand, what you get in that case is you get a decrease in these low frequency fluctuations. So the low frequency green fluctuations have been replaced now by uh, a higher frequency uh, set of oscillations. You can see there's the, the, the signal is more spiky, indicating that there's overall a higher frequency oscillation and there's a reduction in the lower frequency oscillation. So this is the kind of signal that you get out of um, ECOG or brain surface recordings. And this is also something that gives you an aggregated view of the brain state, but it's useful in the sense that you can now use a computer to detect changes in the brain signal in terms of looking at for example, the frequency content, uh, you know, how rapidly is the brain signal fluctuating at any particular location? And therefore, you can read out the um, state uh, of the brain. So for example, if a person is making a movement or not, or even more interestingly, if they're imagining movement, you get a similar kind of reduction in the slow frequency oscillations. So we can actually even decode if a person is imagining making a movement, as we'll see in a, in a future slide. And then finally, if you want to really get a, a much more in-depth uh, view of the brain, then you have to go deeper. You have to uh, use the, these microelectrodes, an array of microelectrodes in this case. And the array of microelectrodes will give you uh, signals that look like this particular graph here. So each of these dots is one spike or action potential, which is sort of the currency of information uh, in the brain. Uh, each neuron emits a spike or an all or none pulse, uh, which is given by this little, one of these, uh, some of these dots, all these dots over here. And so each of the rows over here uh, indicates the activity of one particular neuron. And there are about 150 neurons that are shown here. So here's time uh, from zero to about 400 milliseconds, uh, 300 uh, milliseconds here. And you can see that at any point in time, there's several of these neurons that are, that are spiking, that are emitting an action potential. And uh, uh, this particular aggregated activity could potentially be used for uh, decoding information, for decoding what the brain uh, is doing, what the person wants to do, and so on. So that's a much more precise view 
of, of what's happening at a very small location in the brain. Uh, so it's a, it's a trade-off there between EEG and ECOG, which looks at a, which has the potential to look across the brain in many, many different locations. Whereas uh, microelectrodes typically are focused on one very small region of the brain, but you get a much more precise reading of what's happening in that particular location. All right, great. Um, so yeah, so let's look at what we can do with these types of recordings, right? So uh, if you are given uh, these microelectrode recordings from multiple neurons in any particular location in the brain, then uh, what people have shown, and we've done this also in our lab, is that we can combine it with some AI algorithm, some machine learning or AI algorithm, and you can use it to, uh, for example, control a prosthetic device, such as a prosthetic hand, a robotic arm and hand system. Uh, and this in turn could help somebody who's paralyzed regain some lost function, uh, in this case, movement. Um, and, and that's something that uh, we, can, we can look at in terms of a, a proof of concept application to begin with um, before commercializing that particular technology. Uh, so the question then would be, what does this AI algorithm look like? So how do we actually take a signal that looks like this, all these, uh, the activities of, of cells in a particular location of the brain, and how do we extract information that allows us to control a robotic hand or a robotic arm? So, so let's dive a little bit deeper. So here's um, a seminal result uh, going back to 1988 from Georgopoulos and more recently being, uh, it's been uh, used for building a brain machine interface by you at all. And the idea here is, uh, you know, if, if you look at a simple experiment, uh, you, can, you can do this at your on your tabletop. Uh, you, can, you, uh, you can move your hand from one location on the table to one of these yellow locations, uh, any of these locations. And as you're moving your hand towards those locations, in your motor cortex, in your region in your brain that controls um, your movement, movement of the hand, you'll see some interesting activity. So uh, here's a depiction uh, with the black lines over here are the activities of uh, many, many neurons in the motor cortex uh, of the brain. And the longer the line, the more the activity. So that's the firing rate, how many spikes or how many action potentials per second the neuron is firing. And each of these lines is one particular neuron that uh, you're recording from. And you can see that these, uh, these are plotted in such a way that they map to the directions that are shown on the left-hand side. So there's neurons, there might be a neuron that prefers one particular direction of motion, such as this one over here moving towards the left. So whenever the hand moves towards the left, that neuron fires a lot. But if the hand is moving towards the right, then the hand may not fire, right? So you can see that all the different directions are spanned by many different neurons. And so what one can do then, and here's the algorithm, or if you wanna call it AI, uh, this is what that algorithm does. The method uh, takes the firing rates, so how rapidly all the different neurons are firing, and it essentially uses that as a weight and multiplies that with the preferred direction of that neuron. So each neuron, remember, prefers some particular direction. So you just add up all of these black lines and you get this arrow. This is the vector that is your best prediction. So the computer's best prediction of what the intended direction of movement is. So you can see how if the, uh, uh, if, if the person moves their hand in this direction, adding up all of these activities, you know, with the weighted by the preferred direction of each of those individual cells, uh, allows you to reconstruct the direction of motion, which is given by this red line. And typically it's a pretty decent approximation to what the person really is doing. Um, and now what you can take this one step further and say, okay, what if you're not doing the movement physically, but you're just imagining making that movement? And it turns out that even that works. So even if when you're forming the intention to move, you're imagining moving your hand, you still get activations of these cells. And so you can use that uh, uh, weighted sum of all these activities to make a prediction about where the intended movement uh, direction is. And you can use that then to control a robotic arm to move in a particular direction. Um, and so that's exactly what uh, this, uh, the University of Pittsburgh researchers did. Uh, so in this case, you'll see a video of a woman who's been paralyzed for many years, uh, she, she has tetraplegia. Uh, but uh, after 13 weeks of practice with, a, uh, with an interface that's shown over here, uh, you can see that the signals are recorded from her motor regions of her brain, a motor cortex, and then they're uh, amplified. And then um, you're using the same technology of adding up those activities weighted by the preferred directions of those neurons. Uh, she was able to learn to control this 
pretty complicated robotic uh, arm of a seven degrees of freedom robotic arm. So it has uh, the ability to move in three dimensional space as well as the ability to rotate this uh, robotic hand and then open and close uh, the robotic hand to grasp uh, an object. And so what you'll see in the video is the very first time uh, she's able to feed herself uh, some chocolate. Uh, and this is all done using uh, microelectrode recordings, so recordings from uh, individual neurons uh, in the brain. So you can see her grasping uh, the, uh, the object that contains a piece of chocolate, and uh, she's able to move it to her mouth and, and uh, feed herself uh, for the first time in many years. And so uh, that was back in 2012. Uh, people have uh, made several advances since then, and so I think uh, we're getting better and better at figuring out how do we take the information from the brain and translate that to controlling these complicated devices such as a robotic arm. And so uh, the, uh, we, have, we are not there yet in terms of commercializing this and having this in the home of the patient. It's still being done only in, in laboratories around the world. But uh, I think the technology is moving fast enough that at some point in the not so distant future, we hope that these types of uh, prosthetics, brain control prosthetics will will be available to patients to use uh, in their homes. Uh, another application of uh, this kind of technology, a brain coprocessor, is uh, you can use it to serve as a bridge, to bridge between two areas if they become disconnected. So imagine uh, if there's a stroke in the brain, and so the green area, the, uh, the green area shown over here has become disconnected from the red uh, circled area. And so one can use a, bra a brain coprocessor as a way to bridge that connection and essentially form an artificial connection from the uh, one region of the brain to another region of the brain. And uh, one simple experiment that my colleague uh, F. Fetz and his uh, collaborators here at the University of Washington did was to do exactly this kind of an experiment, but uh, using a very simple type uh, of an algorithm. So there was not really much of an artificial intelligence there in the, in the brain coprocessor. What they did was they took each input uh, spike. So each of these is one little pulse coming from uh, uh, one particular neuron that you're recording from. And so for every pulse or every spike from a neuron, they delivered uh, one electrical pulse. So it's a simple one-to-one -one mapping, and they were able to form this artificial connection from one region of the brain to the other. And they essentially mapped every time you get a spike uh, or activity in one location in the brain, you get an electrical stimulation. You get a pulse uh, of electrical stimulation in the other region of the brain. And they essentially had this going for two days in an animal. And what they observed was that uh, when you have these two regions in the brain artificially coupled, you get a strengthening of the connection. And this comes about because of a well-known mechanism in the brain called Hebbian plasticity, named after Donald Hebb, uh, who was a famous um, neuropsychologist from Canada. And the idea here is when you're co-activating brain regions, you know, uh, in this case, using artificial, an artificial connection, those two um, areas uh, tend to get more and more connected. And that's a very classic uh, kind of plasticity mechanism in the brain that we are leveraging here using a coprocessor to create an artificial connection. And eventually, uh, you will not need the coprocessor. You can take the coprocessor out because you may have strengthened the two connections, the two areas, the connections between the two areas, so that they're strong enough, for example, to um, activate uh, movement, for example. And so you might ask, how would they figure out that the connections were strengthened? So here's just some data from their paper uh, published in Nature. And what they showed was that uh, after coupling the two areas, this gray area is when the, two, the red area was coupled to the uh, green area, the red area's response tends to become more and more like what the green area was doing. So you can essentially see that in this graph, here's time over days, and here's the, uh, the mean force, the torque uh, that you get uh, as, as when you stimulate that particular region, the red region, you can see that its function starts to resemble more and more the function of the, uh, the green region. Uh, it's indirectly indicative that there's been a strengthening of connection. That's shown over here in this particular picture showing that you can actually enhance connections using this kind of an artificial connection created by a coprocessor connecting one-to-one, uh, -one, essentially uh, recording to stimulation. So um, what we're doing now is taking this a step further. We're, we're planning to have human trials in the future um, where we would, we would like to essentially use this principle to help people who have stroke, where uh, if there are two areas that have become uh, disconnected due to the stroke, uh, hopefully we can um, strengthen the remaining connections uh, from, from that area or indirect connections from one area to the other area 
using this kind of a coprocessor. And that's something that uh, would help somebody who has stroke and maybe uh, provide them with a very targeted solution in terms of um, helping them rehabilitate uh, the brain. All right, so what else can we do um, using um, brain signals? So uh, if you recall, the other technique that we talked about was ECOG, which was recording from the brain surface. And uh, we can use that kind of a signal uh, to do several things. One, uh, one thing you could do with that is to connect it to a computer cursor. And so, uh, for example, you can uh, ask the, uh, the subject, uh, in this case, a human subject uh, who was in the hospital uh, with the uh, electrodes, the ECOG electrodes on the surface of their brain. You can ask them to, for example, control a cursor to hit a target. So let's say you had a target. Here, uh, I'm gonna show you a video where you'll see a target either at the top or the uh, top of the screen or the bottom of the screen. And the person has to essentially imagine, uh, in this case, saying the word move. So they just um, imagine saying the word move uh, repeatedly. So move, 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 and so on. But not say that aloud, but imagine saying it. And uh, that triggers activity in a particular area of the brain, the, the area that's uh, classically called Broca's area of the brain. And so you can see in, in, this, um, in this, on the right-hand side, what you'll see is whenever there's a target at the top part of the screen, the person tends to activate, which will be shown by a big red in this region of the brain. So the, the red indicates heightened activation uh, of a particular location in the brain. And that in turn is coupled to the movement of the cursor. And so you'll see the cursor moving to the, to, to the top whenever the person activates that uh, speech region of the brain. And then in order to make it go down, the person relaxes and does not do anything. So it's a very simple way to get the cursor to go down, is to say, just remain calm and do not imagine you know, saying anything. Um, and so that's the paradigm that we used. And you can see how in this case, the coprocessor is just taking neural recordings, and this, in this case, uh, ECOG recordings, and then processing it to translate it into a control signal for the external cursor in this case is what the actuator is. And uh, let's look at the video to see how that works. So this takes only you know, uh, half an hour to an hour for the patient to learn to control the cursor. So the target is at the bottom. You can see the cursor moving to the bottom, and there was not an, an activation. Now you can see very rapidly there's activation in that area. So when it becomes red, that's when the cursor goes up. Uh, when it's down, it's more, more or less blue. And blue is when the, the activity is not very high. And so the cursor, you can see, tends to go down when the activity is blue in that particular location. Um, so that's essentially a very simple demonstration of brain-controlled uh, cursor. And you can imagine this extending to two dimensions. You can then replace the mouse. You could use it for somebody who is logged in, who cannot communicate with the external world or their loved ones, but they can use this kind of an interface to uh, communicate with uh, the external, external world by using a computer. Um, and you know, if you recall, uh, Stephen Hawking um, had uh, a particular disease uh, called ALS that was progressively you know, causing, his, uh, causing him to lose his motor uh, uh, function. Uh, something like this kind of an interface could potentially be used for people who have that uh, debilitating condition uh, to eventually still retain some capacity to communicate um, by controlling a cursor. Now, the reason why we did this experiment was to also explore what's happening in the brain as they're learning to control this cursor, an artificial device. So let's look at the result that we got. So we can see that the, uh, the top is, is, uh, shows, the top set of brains over here shows what's happening in the brain uh, starting from the initial run, so the very first time that they were trying to control the cursor, all the way to run number four, where they're, they've become pretty proficient in controlling the cursor. And what you can see is then the accuracy is around 48%, so not, it's like chance accuracy, uh, it can hit up or down. Uh, there's not much activation in the location that we need it to be active, but over the course of uh, several runs, um, they're able to uh, activate that particular region, uh, the imagined speech region, the speech region of the brain, to get more and more activated, and that in turn causes the cursor to go and hit the target. Um, one remarkable thing here is that um, the activation that you get uh, once they have become proficient, in fact, uh, exceeds the activation that the person has when they're just moving their own hand. So, uh, or in this case, saying the word move, right? So the activation you get uh, when you're actually working a physical movement of your body um, is actually exceeded over here. Uh, so the brain has, in this case, uh, utilized its... Uh, capacity to adapt and be very plastic. It's used that capacity to really enhance its ability to control the cursor. And that's something remarkable where we, we're starting to see the capacity of the brain to really adapt to these very novel 
uh, modes of interaction with the with the environment. Something that evolution probably was not, uh, you know, uh, did not uh, anticipate in this particular sense. But then, you know, it's it's actually quite uh, remarkable. The brain can can uh, start to adapt itself to control these kinds of devices, such as cursors and robotic prosthetics. All right. Uh, what about uh, non-invasive um, co-processors? So it's not um, uh, if if you're not going into the hospital for surgery and you don't want to have microelectrodes in your brain. Uh, what can we do with EEG? Do you remember that EEG is recording from the scalp? It's recording from uh, the scalp several hundreds of thousands of, of neurons. And so, can we do something uh, with that kind of recording? And it turns out that even EEG is actually good enough for uh, us to extract information about uh, imagined movements. So what we did here was we had a person train themselves. So this takes longer than just one day. So the person comes into the lab and they train for several days, perhaps weeks, to generate signals uh, in, the, uh, in the EEG. And uh, in this case, what they did was we trained them to imagine moving their feet to make them go forward in this virtual environment. And they imagined moving their left hand to, make, uh, to, uh, to move leftward in this um, virtual world. And then finally, when you imagine your right hand, it allows uh, the computer to then um, allow you to move um, to the right. And so essentially, it was a natural mapping of uh, foot imagery is forwards, left hand imagery is leftward, and right hand imagery is rightward. And for those of you who are interested in you know, how did we really uh, do this, uh, it was using, again, an, an AI, an artificial intelligence algorithm um, uh, that is. Uh, uh, called the linear discriminant analysis, a statistical technique. And so you collect lots of data where, we, where you ask them to imagine moving their feet or imagine moving their left hand, right hand. And once you collect enough data, you can train this uh, classifier, this uh, statistical classifier. And so the AI here is essentially classifying brain signals into these three different categories. And then the uh, computer is then using those three different uh, categories. One of them is being conveyed to it. And so it can move the person forward, left or right. So let's look at um, an example of that. So in this case, the person is navigating a maze and they're trying to pick up these gold coins that are strewn about in this environment. And so the goal is, the, the purpose of the game is to pick up those, uh, those, those gold coins that are in the environment. And you have to do that while avoiding obstacles such as trees and these uh, blocks that are placed in the environment. And you can see there's this, uh, I guess here it looks blue. So there's this uh, coins that are uh, in the environment that you're supposed to pick up. And remember that this is after several days of training. So you have to really train yourself, uh, in this case, because it's EEG, uh, the signals are not as uh, strong as you, would, you might get, for example, from ECOG um, or even from microelectrodes. So this, is, uh, this is essentially, uh, it takes time to learn. And you can see here, as given by the blue line, that the person was able to navigate, avoid obstacles, and pick up these, um, these coins that are in the, in the environment. Um, as another example uh, of what we can do with EEG, um, this is something that Larry had mentioned, um, and you can sort of look at it as Iron Man 1.0, but essentially this was back in 2008, we were able to use EEG to control a, a pretty complex humanoid robot. So you can see the humanoid robot on the left side, it's a miniature humanoid robot. You can kind of think of it as a robotic avatar of, of the person controlling it. Um, and the uh, task here was for the robot to uh, go and pick up one of these two objects. So it's a red object and a green object within the lab here on a miniature table. And the person gets to pick uh, one of those two objects based on uh, just the brain signal. So the, the brain signal is used in this case to, to command the robot to pick one of those two objects. Now all the very hard sort of control problems of the robot walking and, and so on is done uh, by the robot itself. So we program the robot to do a lot of the low level control uh, what the human does is just convey the high-level commands. So think of the robot as you know, a spinal cord right? that does a lot of the lower level uh, walking and, and picking up and so on, but the, the brain is basically, in this case, the brain of the human. So the brain of the robot is the brain of the human, and, 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 and the human is conveying both you know, what object to pick up that it sees in the environment, and also which of these look, two, two tables, so there's a table on the left side, table on the right side, which of those two tables to bring the object and place, it, place the object uh, on is something that the, uh, the person uh, detects. And you can see uh, when I played the video how, how that happens. Um, so here, here it is. So you can see that uh, once the robot starts moving, it conveys what it sees back to the user. So you can see here's this uh, camera image. It's a robot's uh, point of view. And then that image is then conveyed. And here's where the selection happens. So you can see these 
two images flashing, and the flashing generates a signal in the EEG. And so if you're focusing on the red object in this case, then whenever the red object image flashes, the EEG uh, generates a particular response which the computer then recognizes. So again, we're using a classifier, a machine learning classifier called uh, support vector machine, and that uh, recognizes what the brain signal is, and it figures out which object to pick, and then here the robot conveys it uh, to that particular location that the user picked, in this case, the blue um, table with the square on it. So, so that was the very first uh, brain control robotic avatar, and you can see how this kind of a scenario uh, could potentially in the future lead to some pretty interesting uh, opportunities for telepresence, right? Where, for example, you know, instead of using Zoom, as we're doing right now, it could actually, you, I could actually be there uh, in, in, uh, in DC, for example, with my robotic avatar somewhere in DC. But of course, we're quite a long ways uh, from that. Uh, but eventually, you can imagine a future where this might even obviate the need for air travel, right? So um, that's something to think about. Um, all right. So, so far, I've been um, talking about how you can uh, convey signals from the brain um, of a person to, for example, a computer uh, or a robotic device such as this one. So around 2010, uh, you know, after, the, after we did this experiment with the human robot about 2009 or 2010, um, I started wondering, you know, uh, what if we could send the signal that you extract from the brain, uh, not just to a, uh, a robotic device or you know, a computer cursor, but uh, can we send information from the brain to um, another person, right? another person's brain directly? Uh, and you might wonder, okay, why do we need to do that? Well, besides the, um, the science fiction aspect of it, and also the, the fact that um, this could potentially open, up, open the door to a new way of uh, communicating uh, with another person, a uh, person who might be uh, logged in, for example. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, here an opportunity for us to understand the brain itself. So when you have brains connected to each other, uh, it creates a whole new set of dynamics between the brains. And so potentially we can, it can reveal uh, some important aspects of brain function itself. So there's a lot of different reasons why um, such an experiment um, you know, uh, might, might uh, be uh, interesting uh, and useful and, and impactful as we look forward into the future. So the question here is, uh, if you really want to do this kind of a Professor X-like um, you know, proof of concept demonstration, how do we do that? Well, we need some way to convey information or write information into somebody's brain. And we want to do that with a completely non-invasive technology. So we're using non-invasive EEG to extract information from the brain. So can we also use a non-invasive technique to send information into the brain of another person. So uh, luckily for us, uh, there is a technology called uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. And so TMS uh, actually leverages uh, Faraday's law of uh, induction. So essentially it um, uses the fact that when you convey electric current, uh, in this case through these loops, uh, it induces a magnetic field. And the magnetic field penetrates the skull uh, and the meninges and it induces an electrical current inside the brain, um, you know, somewhere near the surface uh, of the brain, but still uh, inside the brain. And this induced current uh, could cause um, uh, excitation or inhibition of, of uh, neurons, of populations of brain cells that are directly underneath this uh, coil, this H-shaped coil, which is the TMS uh, coil, the mag transcranial magnetic stimulation coil. And so that's one way in which you can start to perturb the activity or to uh, uh, electrically influence the activity of uh, cells in this region. Now you can ask, okay, what's the point of, of doing that? Well, it turns out that if you uh, magnetically stimulate using this technique, the uh, area of the cortex, you know, the area of the brain that controls um, your hand movement. So for example, um, you know, when you stimulate that particular location that controls my hand, uh, what you'll see is that my hand will twitch, right? It'll, it'll move, it, it might move up and down, for example. So I do get a movement of the hand uh, which is generated subconsciously. It's not that I consciously move my hand, but because there was this magnetic stimulus, which caused an electric current in my brain uh, region that controls my hand, I'm going to get a movement of my hand. And I'm only going to notice it after my hand has moved. So it's a little bit creepy in that sense, because you know, it's almost like my hand is involuntarily being controlled. Uh, but uh, that only happens if you position this coil correctly in, in the exact region. So we have to map the brain region that, that controls movements and then position this close, I mean, right on the head, as you can see over here. 
and it has to be in the exact right location in order to get the uh, a person's hand to move uh, just just uh, up and down for example uh, similarly if you uh, position this magnetic coil at the back of the head so the back of the of the of the head is where you have uh, you know the visual cortex which uh, allows you to see and so when you stimulate the visual cortex using this technique what you'll see are something called phosphenes so these are essentially little flashes of light. They could be little blobs, uh, circles, or, or, or stripes, or rectangle, uh, or just any particular shape, depending on how you're positioning this coil at the back of the head. And so that can also be used as a way to convey information into the brain. So we've used it as a way, for example, to send um, information into the brain like a Morse code, right? So you can say a flash is a yes, and no flash uh, is a no answer. So you can essentially send binary information into the brain non-invasively by stimulating the visual cortex using this technique. So those are just two examples where in one case, you can get uh, a movement. Uh, in the other case, you can get somebody to perceive something or see something, even though there's nothing in front of their eyes, they're actually seeing a little flash of light. Uh, that's because the back of the head, you know, the visual cortex is being stimulated non-invasively using this technique. So, so those are, uh, that's, one, that's a, a non-invasive way to stimulate the brain. And so what we did was uh, uh, essentially did a proof of concept experiment um, back in 2013. So, um, and we got permission initially only to do it with two subjects. So here's me uh, uh, as a guinea pig here and my collaborator, Andreas Toko. And the concept was quite simple. So we were trying to see if you know, we can extract information from one person called the sender of, of messages. Can we extract information from one person's brain uh, and then send it, in this case, over the internet to the other person's computer, which then encodes that information as a stimulation parameter for the TMS, the coil, that is, uh, as you can see on the top of Andrea's head. Um, and then that in turn causes his hand to move uh, every time that you know, I do something here. So what I'm doing here is imagining moving my hand. And anytime I imagine moving my hand, if it's correctly decoded by, the, by my computer, then it goes through the internet and then it causes an activation of Andrea's motor cortex and causes his hand to move. And in order to show that we can do something useful, I mean, this is, uh, you have to demonstrate that there's a collaboration going on between the two brains. Uh, what we did was we had a computer game. So in this game, I can see the game of what's happening in the game. So there's uh, these rockets that are threatening a particular city. And the goal of the sender is to destroy the rocket. But unfortunately, I can see the game, but I don't have any way to control it. Uh, whereas uh, Andrea, the receiver, has a keyboard, but he's not able to see the game. So one person can see but cannot do, and the other person can do but cannot see. So the only way for this game to be, um, for this task to be solved um, is for the two brains to collaborate uh, directly. So the first person has to correctly convey that there's a rocket threatening the city, and the second person uh, moves their hand, uh, in this case involuntarily, uh, because the signal is directly targeting their brain, in order to destroy uh, that particular rocket. So. And in terms of a brain coprocessor, you can see that in, each, in, in this case, each person has a, a coprocessor that is recording. Uh, and uh, the sender's uh, coprocessor is recording and sending a signal. And then the uh, receiver's coprocessor is receiving that signal from the other person, uh, from the sender, and then is stimulating the brain. So you can see how the coprocessor framework applies in this case also to build a brain-to-brain -brain interface in this case. So let's look at uh, the, the very first video of that. Uh, so here's our, you can almost call it our eureka moment, I guess. So uh, here's me imagining moving my right hand. And uh, in doing so, I'm, I'm trying to control this cursor to hit the target. And any time that I actually uh, correctly hit the target, what you'll see on the right-hand side is Andrea's hand moving. And you can see, you can barely see his hand moving. That's the kind of movement you get when you stimulate the top of the head where his motor cortex is. But that's sufficient to hit the keyboard and in this case, uh, it, that causes the rocket to be destroyed. And so um, this particular proof of concept just demonstrates that it is possible to extract information from one brain non-invasively and convey it to another brain in order to cause uh, movement, um, in this case, movement of the hand. A second experiment we did involved um, something like a 20 questions game where one person has something on their mind and they answer yes or no questions about the object and the other person has to guess what that object is, just like in 20 questions. But in that case, we were stimulating not the top of the head, but the back of the head. So the person was getting a yes or no answer using uh, phosphenes. The visual cortex was getting stimulated. So they were able to see uh, a little flash of light whenever the answer was no to a question that they asked about the unknown object. And so that was 
another uh, publication we did uh, in a follow-up publication in 2014. Um, and more recently, uh, what we've done is extended this technology to uh, what we call a brain net. So this involves more than two people, so a multi-person brain net. And so in this case, uh, there was a person, again, the receiver, who's shown in the center here. And the receiver in this case actually has a full-fledged brain coprocessor. So they have a uh, technology, in this case EEG, that records from their brain. Um, they also have uh, technology that stimulates their brain. That's the TMS, that's at the back of the head to stimulate the visual cortex. And they're also getting information from uh, an external source, in this case, the two senders, right? So they're getting information from uh, these two senders who are sending, them, uh, sending this receiver information through this channel. And again, they're collaborating with each other to solve a simple task. In this case, it was a very simple Tetris game. So the question was, uh, you know, do we need to rotate this Tetris block or not? So those of you who play Tetris know that the goal is to figure out the best orientation of this uh, of a particular block uh, so that it fits exactly in this uh, lower level green um, bars that are, that are shown down here in this particular space. And so in this case, as you can see, you need to rotate, you, you actually do not need to rotate the block, but if you do, then you can rotate it again to make it fit back in this uh, location. So the two senders in this case are charged with telling this receiver whether to rotate the block or not, and they get two chances. And the receiver does not know what the bottom of the screen looks like. So that's the constraint that they have. So they have to, so the receiver has to re uh, rely on the two senders to send information about whether to rotate or not. So very simple information coming in. And if, they, uh, if the suggestion is to rotate the block, then there's a stimulation of the back of the head and the receiver sees a flash of light telling them, okay, the answer is yes, I need to rotate. And they can use the EEG cap, this uh, EEG uh, signal uh, to then rotate the block. So, the, so this person is completely using only brain signals and not using their hands uh, you know, or a keyboard to rotate the block or to receive information. Uh, so completely doing it through uh, brain signals. And, uh, uh, and, and just to uh, make it even more um, interesting, what we did was we also introduced some artificial noise. So we uh, picked randomly one of the two senders and we uh, purposefully degraded their information. So essentially uh, inserted incorrect uh, rotation decisions uh, in the information conveyed by one of the senders randomly. And we kept that uh, person fixed as a bad sender so that the other sender is a good sender. So now we have the, uh, these two uh, senders sending, one of them sending reliable information, the other one sending unreliable information. And then the challenge was, you know, just as in any uh, you know, social network, uh, this actually is a social network of, of directly connected brains, can the person who's receiving information figure out which person is more reliable or which information source is more reliable? So as they play the game, they get to know that one person's decision is giving uh, rise to better and better you know, performance on the task. They get to see whether the task was successful or not. So they should be able to infer or learn which of these two senders is more reliable. So that was a challenge uh, that we had. So here's some results. So overall, uh, we tried it with five uh, triads or five triples of subjects. So each of them had three, um, two senders and one receiver. And you can see that uh, they all were able to do much better than chance accuracy, which is a 50-50 chance. Uh, with some of them going all the way up to about 90, but on average, it was about an 81% accuracy across all the different uh, you know, triples of, of subjects. And then the interesting question of uh, where the subjects able to learn which of the two senders is more reliable? Uh, it turns out that they were. So you can, as you can see here, we're plotting the Pearson correlation coefficient between the decision uh, of, this, of, the, of the receiver and the, the two senders. So one is a good sender, the other is a quote unquote bad sender, the one that we were purposefully injecting some uh, incorrect decisions into. And you can see that over time, this uh, plot indicates that there's a higher and higher correlation with the decisions of the good sender and not so much or not at all with respect to the one who's sending the bad uh, decisions. And so in some sense, you can say the, send, uh, the receiver receiving the information from multiple sources or multiple brains in this case, was able to figure out which of the brains is more reliable uh, and which of the brains is less reliable. And that was an interesting uh, result. And in fact, uh, you know, um, we hope that you know, it's similar to how in social media, uh, nowadays, you get lots of uh, bad information, but you have to decide which information source is a, is a good information source. And so here's a very uh, simple um, way of, of demonstrating that with a brain-to-brain -brain interface using a brain net. All right. So uh, 
I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with some interesting sort of forward looking questions here. So uh, one thing we're looking at right now is a very general purpose um, co-processor for the brain. Um, and in this case, we're leveraging some of the recent advances in AI. Uh, you might have heard of uh, the terms deep learning and artificial neural networks. So what we're looking at is using some of these artificial neural networks as the underlying AI, the underlying intelligence for our uh, co-processor. And uh, we, we're also using them as a way to optimize uh, not just you know, the uh, stimulation patterns here, because we don't know what the optimal stimulation patterns are. We're trying to get that by looking at the errors that are external, so the errors that, are, that have to do with behavior. So for example, if you're trying to use this kind of a bridge, um, this coprocessor for somebody who has stroke, then during therapy sessions, they may be trying to reach to a particular object, you know, such as a cup, and so we can measure the uh, error between how far their hand is moving and where the cup is, and that could give it an error signal. And those error signals are exactly what you need to train these artificial neural networks. And so we're using these kinds of um, artificial neural networks not just to train um, the coprocessor network, but also to build these emulator networks, which are essentially replacing some of the function of you know, what happens when you stimulate a particular brain region and how it affects the external behavior. So this is a, a more general framework that we have yet to demonstrate in, in, in human or animal models, but it's something that has the potential to expand the applications of, uh, of coprocessors uh, by leveraging the advances in deep learning. And you'll notice that uh, there's an interesting observation here, which is that in this case, for the very first time, you have artificial neural networks, which were actually inspired by the brain uh, back in the 1940s. Uh, McCulloch and Pitts, um, you know, two applied mathematicians actually created these artificial neural networks inspired by how biological neurons work. And so now we have these artificial neural networks actually interacting directly with uh, biological neural networks. And uh, the hope is that this kind of a, a joining or merge of artificial neural networks with biological neural networks will enable us to you know, solve some very difficult problems in, uh, in, in terms of neurological um, you know, therapies for people who have stroke um, uh, and spinal cord injury and other kinds of neurological conditions. All right, so let me conclude with um, uh, some applications as well as uh, some of the issues that come up when you start looking at these applications. So for example, we've already talked about um, restoration of sensory, motor, and cognitive function. Uh, there's also, uh, if you look at it beyond medical applications, there, there's applications such as our Iron Man example, right? So there's uh, amplification of human abilities, such as physical, sensory, or cognitive function. So for example, uh, if you think about uh, augment, you can have exoskeletons that are controlled by the brain uh, to enhance your physical capacities. This might be useful for uh, people that have to lift heavy loads and so on, um, in construction and so on. Uh, there may be uh, sensory augmentation. Maybe you wanna go beyond your visible spectrum to infrared uh, light. And so uh, there's been experiments where they've shown you could directly feed infrared uh, camera information so that you can start to see in the dark. Um, this is usually done mainly in animals um, uh, so far. Uh, there's also an enhancement of uh, cognitive function, right? So can we actually um, augment our cognitive function, our memories, uh, or even our learning capacities? Um, and then uh, speaking of learning, there's the whole field of education and learning, right? So um, education and learning is, uh, you know, is something that you can, you can see how if you have the capacity to, for example, uh, record from the brain and figure out if a person is grasping a concept, uh, you know, such as a particular concept in calculus, like the, the chain rule in calculus, right? So if you're able to understand the grasping of a particular concept, then uh, you know, through, through a course, if you keep verifying the person has grasped all the concepts, then you don't need to have examinations or tests at all, right? So because you have the ground truth there of, did the person get this or not, right? So it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at testing, right? Similarly for learning, uh, people have shown that uh, stimulation of certain, in certain ways uh, can also um, enhance or accelerate learning. So uh, for example, it can accelerate or it can enhance attention and attention in turn allows you to learn better or it could directly you know, modulate or rewire certain brain connections in a particular way and that could enhance or speed up lear the learning process. Um, and, and, uh, and the other applications that are more obvious would be you know, virtual reality. For example, uh, we've done some experiments where we've shown that uh, you can use brain stimulation, the TMS, non-invasive brain stimulation, to uh, allow a person to navigate a maze, right? a, a virtual maze completely in the dark, completely 
just using brain stimulation. Uh, so you can imagine in VR, you can go beyond just visual reality or visual um, you know, VR to even stimulating centers of the brain that can allow you to have virtual reality for smell, right? So that's very hard to do with a, with a headset, but uh, through brain stimulation, you could potentially have artificial uh, smell and taste uh, being virtually stimulated. Uh, similarly with gaming, right? So it's an obvious application for gaming where you're um, judging the engagement of the person and, and, and adaptively changing the game to accommodate the person's uh, current level of interest. A brain adaptive entertainment is also a big deal. I don't think um, uh, Hollywood has la latched onto this or Netflix or, or you know, um, any of our uh, content providers have latched onto this particular aspect yet. But if it's possible, then you can imagine uh, having entertainment that is adapted to how the brain is reacting from a moment to moment basis. So there's lots of interesting things you can imagine. We're, we're not there yet in any uh, possible way right now, but uh, in the future, you can imagine a potential there for brain adaptive entertainment. I already talked a little bit about telepresence. This was our robot, the, the metallic robot that we call Morpheus that was walking around in that small arena um, and picking up the red and, and green object uh, controlled purely through brain signals. Uh, you can imagine an extension of that for um, uh, telepresence also, where you can have remote uh, telepresence using uh, these kinds of devices. And finally, um, you know, the light detection has been something that people in the field have been looking at. It's controversial. Uh, it's, it's hard to make sure that you don't have any false positives. But if you, if you imagine, uh, uh, you know, compared to polygraphy, which is what a lot of, um, I think, a um, uh, lot of, uh, I guess there's a lot of applications right now that people are still using polygraphy in the country, uh, you can imagine that uh, one would expect to have a better lie detection test using um, a brain signal compared to something like the galvanic skin response and other kinds of external physiological signals. Uh, so there's even some companies that have been formed that are trying to claim, or they claim at least that they do a better job than polygraphy, but I think it's still a controversial uh, claim. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, you know, uh, there's always, uh, uh, I guess, marketeers that are looking at how you can uh, sell things in a better way. So Neuromarketing is a term used to uh, signal any kind of methodology that uses brain signals to um, either judge how good a particular uh, ad is or how good any particular uh, content is before you actually release it. So neuromarketing has also led to several companies trying to use brain signals for marketing. Uh, of course, these applications lead to uh, lots of ethical and moral issues. So for example, health and safety, that's something that has to do with any kind of brain implant or any kind of um, biological implant. Uh, you have to weigh the risks versus benefits. Uh, the more interesting kinds of issues that come about with brain uh, co-processors are the questions of identity and agency, right? So as you interact, as the brain interacts with the device, um, uh, there may be cases where uh, the, uh, the identity of the person might change because the brain is also adapting to the device. And in some cases, they may even feel like the agency that they had may be not as clear anymore. So it may be lost uh, in the process of this interaction between the brain and the device. So there's some really interesting philosophical and moral issues there in terms of what happens in the long run as the brain starts to utilize this device as a part of its, uh, of its computational processing capacities. And this leads to a lot of legal issues and as you can imagine, lots of liability issues. So who's responsible when the person uh, does something that causes harm or injury? Uh, is it, uh, you know, is it the device is that the person is actually both. Uh, so it leads to a lot of um, you know, things that need to be worked out in the, in the legal uh, profession. Um, security and privacy is paramount, uh, as you can imagine. And you know, there's uh, all, all kinds of science fiction uh, scenarios that are dystopian that you can imagine, such as brain tapping, uh, brain washing, literally, in this case, and also brain viruses. I mean, these are all just scenarios that are possible given that you have a, a device that in case it's connected you know, through the internet or wirelessly, you can, you can have those kinds of issues. And so it's really important that we address those. Um, and it's not just security algorithms uh, and, and algorithms for privacy, but also you know, um, make sure that um, there are some legal safeguards there for, for make, ensuring that there's uh, sort of paramount uh, importance uh, placed on security and privacy. Um, and finally, I think the social justice uh, issues are immense. Um, there's going to be if, if these kinds of devices lead to augmentation of humans, uh, there's going to be, uh, again, a, a further division of society into haves and have-nots. The people that are using these devices for augmenting their cognitive capacities and learning capacities. Uh, and so uh, do we need to have, for example, government subsidies, just like we subsidize education 
Um, do we need to have government subsidies for these kinds of devices if they're augmenting uh, people? So I think there's a lot of uh, really important issues there that we're still uh, not completely understand, uh, are not quite completely understood. Uh, at the Center for Neurotechnology, we have a dedicated neuroethics team that is looking into all these issues. And the team members are actually embedded within the engineering teams. So it's one of the first uh, cases where there's ethics members embedded within the engineering teams. And so we get feedback from them and we're, we're making sure that the technologies that we develop have the, the intended benefits and, and we're looking at the side effects of them also. Um, so the question that I'll leave you with is this, right? So are brain coprocessors just another augmentative tool, right? So if you look back into um, human history, right? Starting from the um, invention of the wheel, for example, augmenting our capacity to move, to writing, you know, writing enabled us to uh, augment our memory capacities, our processing capacities, all the way to computers and smartphones now, right? So smartphones we carry all the time and they're augmenting our communicative capacities, our information uh, capacities, our memory capacities, and so on. So is this just a, another step in that progression of tools that hu humans have invented for themselves? Uh, and the more important question, I think, is will they ultimately benefit humanity, right? So uh, will coprocessors, if they become a reality, you know, to the point where people are uh, able to use them um, in an in a, uh, augmentative way, right? Will they ultimately benefit uh, humanity? Uh, so this reminds me of the legend uh, of uh, the Egyptian pharaoh Thamus um, and the Egyptian god uh, Thoth, uh, who is credited with the invention of writing. So uh, Thamus, the Egyptian pharaoh, um, comments uh, you know, to Thoth that, hey, your invention of writing, I mean, it's, it's great, but uh, by neglecting memory, uh, it will produce forgetfulness. So there's something to be said about that. Yes, it, it does produce forgetfulness, but uh, I actually disagree with, with that assessment of Thamus. Um, I think by allowing us to offload uh, the uh, problem of rote memorization, which is what the brain was being used for for a long time, uh, writing allowed the brain to uh, pursue much more uh, you know, creative endeavors, right? So it, it was able to it, it sort of uh, unleash creativity in terms of um, not having to memorize everything because there was writing and you could put uh, things down uh, in writing. Uh, similarly, um, I think coprocessors also have a tremendous potential uh, to benefit uh, humanity. So there's, you definitely have to be careful because there's uh, lots of potential for abuse as we already talked about, but uh, just think about the, the number of people that we can benefit in terms of this technology becoming a, a reality. Um, I mean, uh, going beyond uh, just a single brain, you could have uh, multiple brains collaborating together to solve uh, some of the hardest problems that, uh, that, that humanity is facing. Um, and, and that's something that could be facilitated by uh, these types of uh, coprocessors. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, about the future. And so uh, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you by uh, uh, saying, you know, a bright future beckons um, and I'll entertain questions. So thank you very much for having me. I'll, uh, I want to acknowledge the students without whom uh, this wouldn't be possible, uh, the things that I talked about and also my collaborators and, and uh, funding, uh, especially thanks to everyone at the Center for Neurotechnology. And so please visit us uh, in Seattle whenever you can. Uh, and that's how Seattle looks every day of the week, right? So thank you very much. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, maybe you can unshare your slides for now. Great. All right. Although I have to say, um, I think that was an augmented reality slide of Seattle. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have time. For some questions. Um, as I mentioned before, there's three ways to ask questions. If you're on the Zoom, you can put your hand up and ask a question directly in your microphone. If you're on the Zoom, you can ask using uh, text and Q&A. And if you're on YouTube, you can ask a question via the YouTube chat. So I think maybe we'll start with a, a question from Um, Newton Campbell, he wanted to know how does optogenetics fit into the taxonomy of technologies to rewrite the brain? Yeah, great question. So I didn't talk about optogenetics, but that's one of the, I would say, the sort of most cutting edge technology right now. Um, and it's done mainly in animals at this point, um, because I mean, you are modifying the, uh, the genetics of the animal. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's a much more precise way of, um, of actually uh, manipulating and recording from the brain, right? So 
uh, in optogenetics, you're uh, you're you're um, changing uh, you know the uh, 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 the genes in such a way that you can then image the activities of, of individual cells. And you can actually do it in such a way that it's, you can also image uh, just particular types of neurons in the brain, which is even more uh, precise than the electrical recording methodologies that I talked about. So uh, optogenetics, I think, is a, is a wonderful technology. I think it's probably the, the way, of, uh, way of the future, at least in terms of animal models or animal experiments. Um, uh, the, the question is whether when you start to look at how you would do it in humans, can we do it safely in humans, right? So can we uh, make it safe, can we do it safely, but also uh, typically in optogenetics, it's not non-invasive. Um, at least the traditional technologies, you do have to open up the skull and you have to um, you know, image that the part of the brain um, that, you're, uh, that you're actually trying to uh, record from. And so the question would be, can we um, also, I mean, first of all, make sure that the genetic modifications uh, don't have uh, the this, this kind of side effects that might uh, prevent people from using it. But at the same time also, uh, can we also make the technologies non-invasive? And I think there's some progress being made in that, but uh, it's definitely a technology that at least for now we can use to test some of our brain co-processor ideas uh, in animal models. The next question is from Tony Tether. Hello, Tony. You have to unmute your mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Welcome. Hi, I'm Tony Tether. I, I was heavily involved in, in all of this in the uh, 2000 uh, time frame, uh, you know, at DARPA. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of what you talked about was very familiar to me. In fact, I'm really glad. I, when, I, when this came across my desk today, I definitely said I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And I'm, I'm very impressed. I, I, uh, you know, we did a lot of this in, in that time. Of course, we did bird to bird talk to show that you could, you know, we had a macaw, I think, and uh, the male macaw, uh, we, hit, we separated them in the male, made, made a mating signal with a cry, and uh, the, the, then we transmitted that to a female in another location, and she responded. Uh, so we knew that the, that the message went across. Uh, and I'm impressed with what you've done. But I'm, I'm also, 10 years have passed. And, and I'm also, I, and while I'm impressed with what you've done, it seems like it's not 10 years of progress. Uh, uh, you know, I, and I don't know why. I mean, has it just been a lack of money? I'm really looking for answers from you because I'd like to see if we, I can help, okay? Uh, it, it, I can't tell. Is it lack of money or is all this ethics stuff, uh, uh, you know, getting in the way? Um, and if that's the case, that's going to be really difficult. Money, I think I know how to solve that problem. Uh, but the ethics will be different. And of course, there's a great book out that I don't know if you've read it, uh, where, where a person uh, in the book, uh, he, he comes up with the evolution. This is nothing more than the next evolution of mankind as we move from, uh, from uh, uh, being made out of uh, cells into actually just being mechanical over a period of time. You know, very intelligent robots. But, you know, and if you think about it, who would know the difference? Uh, Anyways, that my question to you is, why over 10 years has the progress seemed to be really, really not, not, not 10 years worth? Okay. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Tony. I mean, good to, good to have you here. Um, and I think yeah, that's a great uh, observation in terms of what's been happening in the field. Uh, so it's interesting, if you look at the history of the field, um, I think a lot of people trace it back to the 1960s when we had uh, uh, people like F. Fetz, who's still uh, at our center here at the University of Washington. So he showed that a monkey can control a, a needle by using the activity of a single neuron in its motor cortex. That was the very first brain computer interface. He didn't call it that in those days, but it was basically the first demonstration of a brain connected to a computer. And then the field essentially didn't, uh, I mean, it, there was not like a tremendous advance until the, I would say the late 1990s, right, in 2000s, when there was a renewed interest uh, in, in this area. Um, and even in the case of stimulation, right, uh, there was a, a professor, Jose Delgado, who did some experiments. Yeah. You might have heard about that. You know, he yeah. stopped a bull in his tracks. There's this YouTube video you can look at by, you know, stimulating a particular location in his brain. The bull was attacking him, and then he was able to stop it right, you know, as it was about to you know, attack him. So uh, there were already these kinds of experiments being done in the 60s. Uh, it's only in the 1990s and 2000s that uh, there was progress made because of the availability, availability of um, you know, better computing technologies, I mean, uh, more powerful computers to uh, decode these signals, and also better recording technologies where you're recording from many neurons at the same time. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, there has been progress in terms of 
the bandwidth of, of um, you know, information being extracted um, from, uh, from the brain, especially using the invasive techniques uh, like the Utah array that I uh, showed a picture of. Um, but, uh, but you're right that you know, we have not seen any of that translated into uh, commercial technologies that are, you know, for example, the, I showed you the, the video of a person controlling a robotic arm uh, and, and feeding herself. That technology is still not in the market, and that was done in the in 2012, right? So, um, oh, that was actually the, it was also done in the early 2000s too, as well. Yeah, was, you know, yeah, so there it, were already people doing that in the yeah. early 2000s. John Donahue and yeah, right, uh, right. Nicole Ellis and so on, yeah. right? So, uh, I think so. That's been going on for a while. Uh, part of the reason I think is uh, like like you said, like the safety issues and the robustness, right? So, how do we make sure that you protect from liability and so on? How do you make it robust? Because may, most of the time, when you're doing this experiments, you're in a lab and there's somebody making sure all the conditions are met. Uh, and once you take it out in the open and you uh, leave it with a person, many things can go wrong, right? First of all, the, 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 ro the robot prosthetics may not themselves be very robust. Uh, but secondly, also, you know, the interface itself uh, needs to be, you know, um, good enough that it, it actually does not lead to infections and so on. So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a problem in terms of both um, technology not being there yet uh, but also, um, I think, uh, trying to resolve some of these uh, uh, more thorny issues of liability, safety, and so on. Um, uh, there are some commercial entities. You might have heard about uh, Elon Musk has a company called yes, yes. Neuralink. Um, yeah. And they've, their goal is actually to make it, uh, commercial, uh, make it to commercial devices. And they're using technology that is actually not too far away from you know, the kind of devices I showed. Uh, um, I showed you the control of the, the University of Pittsburgh, you know, robotic arm. Uh, and they were using, you know, the, the UTARA, which is a um, hundred electrode, you know, recording from about a hundred neurons yeah. um, at a time. But I think the, uh, the, the Elon Musk company, Neuralink's got uh, electro, uh, these devices now that can record from many thousands of, of neurons at the same and, time. And, I, and IBM has, uh, you know, it, it, once we get five nanometer nodes, they will have a brain with a coprocessor, which is going to be equal to the human brain. And all it needs to do is be taught, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think the progress is being made, but it's uh, maybe not as fast as one might have uh, wanted yeah, to no, be. Ten, ten, ten years, I mean, it, it, if you think of the things that have changed in the last 10 years, I mean, yeah. this has been at a linear rate as opposed to an exponential rate, which I That's would have true. Expected, so would, I'd love to have, can I get a copy of, of, of uh, in, in Zoom, uh, you, the, the session has been made a copy, I assume, as, you, as you've been doing it. Is it, yeah, is we'll, it we'll, we'll be posting a copy to YouTube. And uh, we'll send you links. And uh, this live stream is uh, going to be on YouTube immediately after the okay. we finish. Yeah. If you would like, I would like to. Uh, I, I would like to. In, in, if you're interested in, in maybe getting more funding, I mean, I don't know if you're interested or not. But I, I, oh, we're always interested. I, I, <laughs> I'd like to help. Okay, I'd like to help. I, I'm very impressed with what you've done, and I, and I think I can help. see. We're into another renaissance where all of this is coming back. And so yes, yeah. I think if I can get you in at the beginning of the wave, uh, yeah. you, you maybe you will be able to get back to an exponential increase. I'm sorry yeah. I take so much time. I'll, I'll shut up now. It's but. great to have yeah. you on, Tony. Thanks for yeah. calling. And Tony, in. yeah, send me an I'm email. Sure I think we can uh, communicate. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to you know have any emails or if you want to uh, email me, that's fine. We can. Um, yeah. No. I, uh, do I have? Uh, you, you, can get, you have. A, I'm sure they got your email address. Yes. On this, uh, yeah, Larry has it. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So, great. Thank um, you, Tony. Our, our next. Questioner is a guy named Jag Canlow, and he works on communications and bats. And he's a really great guy. So, uh, Jag, you are on. Just on. There you go. Um, hi. Yes, that was a very fascinating talk, and uh, I was curious if uh, it's possible to actually stimulate the brain anytime one feels stress, because as we know, stress can lead to a lot of. Uh, if, uh, if um, the signal for stress can be detected and the brain can be appropriately stimulated, then we can actually present, prevent the onset of many diseases. So I wonder what is the possibility of doing that? Yeah, and that's a great question. It falls under, you know, can we build these school processors for um, neuropsychiatric uh, conditions? You know, the people have like actually, you know, as Tony was saying, DARPA has funded, uh, you know, the subnets program, which was part of the effort there was to see, can we uh, use stimulation as a way to uh, treat people with uh, conditions like PTSD, for example, 
or depression. Um, so I think the, uh, there's definitely a lot of interest there. Um, and I think the, uh, the tricky issues that come about uh, in the case of stress, for example, is making sure that you um, actually uh, recognize the, the signatures with a very high degree of accuracy. And then also the stimulation, I think, uh, like I talked about, the non-invasive kind is very non-specific, right? So um, it's hard to do that with, with TMS, especially when you have something that might be, uh, the genesis might be deeper in the brain, uh, not necessarily at the cortex level. Um, so I think a lot of the conditions that have to do with, uh, you know, human uh, some psychiatric conditions or well-being or stress and so on uh, tend to be harder to, first of all, understand. I think that's tricky, but then also to manipulate or intervene turns out to be also pretty difficult. So, uh, which is why in the field, you're seeing people tackling the, uh, the easier problem first in the sense of, you know, can we replace uh, or modulate movement, right? So can we give somebody the sen uh, restore the condition of movement? Can we help people who are blind, for example, on the sensory side? Uh, can we restore the sense of touch for somebody who's controlling uh, a prosthetic hand? And so those are the kinds of things that can be done by recording and stimulating uh, you know, the cortex the, uh, on the surface of the brain. But uh, as you get into the, some of these more um, uh, conditions that have to do with more complex interactions of many different areas, it becomes a little bit harder to understand, okay, how do we decrease the level of uh, you know, stress, for example, or anxiety, right? Uh, can we actually help people who are getting more anxious? Can we help people who are depressed, you know, by stimulating particular conditions? So there are people looking at that, uh, you know, in terms of helping people who have uh, mood disorders. Um, and one of the goals of this brain coprocessor framework was to say that, you know, in the, in, the, in the slide I showed where there was an emulator network that is allowing you to optimize an external behavior, uh, that could, in, could potentially be the human saying, you know, right now I'm feeling very stressed, you know, using a scale of, of how stressed you are. And that scale could then be used by the neural networks to configure themselves to deliver the right amount of stimulation for that point in, in the scale, right? So there is at least theoretically a way to translate that idea, but figuring out, you know, where do you stimulate and, you know, uh, how do you uh, uh, record to make sure that you're detecting the stress, uh, you know, um, signatures. Uh, those are, I think, still tricky issues. And people are working on that, but uh, yeah, um, it is possible, but it'll take time. I have a question from- Thank uh, you. Thank Bill, you. Bill Rubin, who was uh, involved in uh, Obama's brain. And uh, Bill, unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. hi. Hi, Rajesh. Hi, Larry. And hi, Tony. Uh, any case, uh, my quest, uh, by the way, the presentation was excellent. The work that you guys are doing is just wonderful. My question is Thank about uh, uh, interest in the complex uh, uh, circuitry underlying learning and reading and potential deficits in things like dyslexia. Is your group uh, working on in, in those areas? So we're, we're definitely working in the area of uh, learning in the sense that, you know, we're looking at how the brain adapts to stimulation and how does it actually uh, learn to optimize a particular task, which might be, which might involve this kind of interaction with a, a brain computer interface or a coprocessor. Uh, we've done some work in that. Um, I showed you the example of the brain interacting with a computer cursor and how it changes over time. And we've done some more studies like that to look at the underlying basis of uh, learning um, these, these neuroprosthetic skills. And it turns out to be very similar to how you learn motor skills, like, uh, for example, learning to drive a car or learning to type and so on. Uh, what we haven't done yet is uh, gone deeper into the uh, sort of education and sort of learning disabilities. I mean, that's something that I think, um, you know, we've, we've uh, looked at that as sort of the, the next frontier uh, beyond what we're doing right now, the next frontier in terms of seeing how can we use um, stimulation uh, technologies as a way to uh, both probe the underlying basis uh, for how we learn um, and then also to see if we can accelerate learning in some particular way. So there's some colleagues of mine uh, here at the University of Washington uh, that I've looked at, for example, um, if you can use TMS, you know, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, but it's, it's actually a very coarse uh, kind of stimulation device. Um, and so I think it's, it's still, we're still not there yet in terms of uh, being able to, um, uh, for example, modulate the, the learning process itself uh, or help somebody with learning disabilities. But on the recording side, I think there has been some progress made in terms of detecting if we can um, at least use it as a, as a way to diagnose particular conditions. 
um, and and uh, during during the the process. Uh, so I think this was done in uh, so this is actually some of uh, Chantal Pratt's work here at the University of Washington. She was looking at uh, EEG, right, the non-invasive scalp recordings, to see if um, there are any correlates of uh, language learning. So if you're trying to learn a second language, you know, what are the brain correlates of being able to acquire uh, a better vocabulary or better concepts during language learning? So just getting at it. I mean, it's not there yet, but we're starting. Well, to I look. I look forward to the progress. Again, uh, great seeing you. Great seeing you, Larry and Rogers. Next time I'm out in Seattle, I hope to come visit my son's uh, uh, a pediatrician at Seattle Children and a professor at University of Washington. Again, congratulations on your great work. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Thank you. You're always welcome in Seattle. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to go Charles Hutner and then uh, Carl Merrill. And then I'll take one from Joe Wilson over uh, YouTube and we'll go from there. So first, Charles. I think I've unmuted. Hello. Thank you Hello. so much for uh, your great presentation. You mentioned memory. Uh, how, how important is memory in your work and where do you find it in the brain? Ah. <laughs> I was dreading that question, but I guess yeah, here it goes. <laughs> so I'm not a memory expert, but uh, I think if you look at uh, where people have uh, applied this kind of a technology for um, memory, you know, either restoration or augmentation, it's uh, been in the hippocampus, you know, the area of the brain that's typically, you know, implicated in, in memory-related processes. And so some of the work, uh, you know, I think the one that's most well-known is the work of Ted Berger and co colleagues at, at USC. And so what they've done, uh, this is in uh, rats, they've shown that, uh, you know, you could potentially um, enhance the performance of the rat in a task by uh, using this kind of a coprocessor-like device that records from one area of the brain called CA3, one of the areas of the hippocampus, and then stimulating another area called uh, CA1. Uh, and then when you do that with this artificial bridge, um, it's able to recognize patterns um, in, in, in that first area and then trigger the, uh, essentially sort of, cheat by delivering the correct kind of stimulation in the other area. And so when the, when the animal's about to make a mistake, it sort of encourages the animal brain to not make that mistake, right? So uh, there have been those kinds of uh, memory, uh, you know, restoration or augmentation type devices that have been tested at least in animal models. Uh, I think they've also done it in, in monkeys. But uh, I think human memory, you know, for example, if, can we help people with Alzheimer's or other kinds of uh, memory disorders? I think that that is a critical question, um, and we need to, I think, uh, uh, do a lot more research, I think, both understanding the uh, underlying, you know, uh, phenomena there, as, as well as seeing how do we, um, you know, build a device that can directly interact with those areas of the brain, um, like the hippocampus or um, other areas of the brain to, um, you know, help people that may have uh, memory you know, deficiencies or disorders. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from uh, Carl Merrill, a longtime member and uh, emeritus professor from uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, one of my main concerns is that um, the, um, the neuronal cells can't re uh, reproduce. And, and so, um, the, the, your deep application or even the surface of the brain, um, what, what studies have been done and how can those areas be protected? Um, and how long can you use something like this on, on a unit? Yeah, Carl, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think it comes about um, quite often uh, and that's something we're all quite uh, concerned about in terms of these technologies if they're uh, actually uh, implanted, for example, inside the brain, then typically what you get is, uh, you know, um, scar tissue formation uh, around the recording electrodes. And so the recording quality might go down over time. Um, I think there's also, uh, like you mentioned, uh, you know, if you're using stimulation, you might be destroying some tissue. Um, I mean, the brain is adaptive. So in, in some cases, it might be able to adapt to whatever um, may be uh, the the damage caused right but of course if you if there's an increased amount of damage I mean that's something that completely obviates the, the whole purpose of having uh, a device and so people in uh, for example people have used these devices for deep brain stimulation have been uh, working around that uh, for, for Parkinson's disease and for um, essential tremor and so on uh, there's also devices uh, for the surface of the brain so there's a company called Neuropace that uses this kind of a closed loop stimulation for uh, seizures so for detecting uh, the initiation of a seizure and then 
stimulation of the brain region to stop the seizure from spreading. Um, so in all those cases, I think uh, there's at least some, some data showing that, um, you know, obviously it's better to have the device operating on the surface of the brain that's less potential for damage, uh, at least in the, in the period in which they've analyzed the data. But if you're penetrating the brain with these electrodes, then um, it benefits to have, I mean, it's beneficial to have uh, more biocompatible electrodes. So the traditional ones are, are stiff and they're, um, they're rigid, uh, whereas uh, the ones more recently that people have tested and we're doing some in our center also is to use uh, biocompatible, you know, flexible electrodes. So flexible electrodes tend to be, they move with the brain, with the pulsation of the brain, and they tend to be less uh, uh, damaging. And then finally, the, I mentioned Elon Musk's company, you know, the Neuralink, and they have a technology now that when you insert, so they actually do have um, uh, microelectrodes that are inserted inside the brain, but they use a robot. So it's like a robotic surgeon that uh, essentially is like stitching, right? It, it plans where to implant these electrodes. It avoids all the uh, blood vessels, the micro blood vessels, and then it's able to implant these very quickly after a lot of planning and, and so on. So the, the claim is that, you know, that could be a way to avoid or at least minimize the damage when you're implanting uh, these, these, these microelectrodes. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's a trade-off there in terms of do you want to get as close as possible to the neurons themselves versus trying to get away with uh, something that's on the surface of the brain or even completely non-invasive? Um, the, the, the other comment I have is that um, I can see this technology being used to augment um, damage in pa patients or, or people who have certain deficits but to think that it's going to augment and make us superhumans may be a misplaced conception. And I'd like your comment on that because um, I, I'd like to quote Ludwig Boltzmann, who once said that um, apparently he had this vision that if, if everything was atoms and he was made up of atoms, then atoms could think. And, and so we already have us and we have computers that can clearly beat us like a computer that can learn to play the game Go in a week or so, whereas it takes a human a lifetime. So I can see us working together as partners, but I don't, it may be a mistake to think that we can augment ourselves and become something that can win the game at Go in one week. And I'd just like you to comment uh, and tell me what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, a very interesting observation. I mean, I think in some sense, you know, uh, with, with the smartphone I have, I'm already augmenting, you know, myself, right, to the extent that it's right there at my fingertips. And I guess we're asking what happens if that technology is directly interacting, you know, with the brain. And so, uh, in fact, I think that was one of the original motivations for, you know, Elon Musk forming that company and Neuralink was, you know, if AI is going to take over the world, then maybe humans, you know, are going to get left behind. So why don't we join with the AI, right? Um, I think what I'm suggesting here is, you know, a technology that, uh, you know, besides the medical applications has the potential to, um, you know, uh, modulate uh, the brain and its sort of plasticity in, in a particular way. And uh, is it, uh, it it's going to allow you to do things like, a, you know, for example, the brain-to-brain uh, -brain interface idea, if you are able to connect brains together, uh, is that going to give you the capacity to be more creative than just one brain can do, right? And the question is, is that right now are we limited just by language, right? So language is what we use for communication and that's how we augment uh, the multiple brains together through collaboration, right? So I think it's a very interesting question uh, in terms of uh, do we um, really, are we really getting anything for, in terms of augmentation, right? Are we getting anything beyond what we already have in terms of using our peripheral sensors and our peripheral actuators, right, hands and so on, to interact with a computer and with the AI. Uh, are we getting anything beyond that, right? And I think in some sense we are, if, if we're using the technology to modulate um, you know, things like accelerating learning, for example, enhancing learning. Uh, but uh, other than that, if, if it's, you know, the ability to access information from the internet really quickly, uh, we, I mean, we we already. I mean, the younger generation is already doing that with a smartphone really quickly, right? I can never type as quickly as my daughter does. <laughs> so, um, so in some sense, uh, I think it remains to be seen. I think it's a great question. Uh, it remains to be seen. Like, how is it going to? How is it going to really? Is it really going to augment us, or is it just another kind of uh, step, um, you know, beyond just you know what we're doing already in terms of uh, smartphones and so on? Let's uh, move on to uh, 
a question from a recording secretary um, or a volunteer, uh, Savannah. Hi, uh, so I have a question about uh, the behind the scenes sort of, uh, clearly your goals are very interdisciplinary and you have lots of experts working in all working together. Uh, and so I was just wondering what sorts of fields people are in in your lab. Um, and then also how do you deal with uh, translating between those different fields of expertise like law and neuroscience and engineering and thing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think the, um, the field actually needs more of these kinds of um, you know, people from different fields contributing to it uh, because just engineers themselves, you know, we, we get carried away with technology, but then I think uh, in our case, you know, when we had uh, our neuroethics team right there, you know, uh, contributing to the design discussions, I think that was really quite an eye opener because, you know, there's things that we don't think about as engineers and scientists that, you know, the ethicists always think about. And so um, in our, in my lab, for example, I have uh, people that are working with, uh, you know, people that are in departments like bioengineering, there's computer scientists, there are uh, the ethicists are typically philosophers, so they're from the philosophy department. Um, and then there's, uh, uh, you know, collaborate with neurosurgeons. So there's MD, PhD students. Um, there's uh, neuroscientists working with animals. So I think the, there's this entire range of, of you know, um, talent there from different disciplines. And that's what I think makes this field very exciting. Um, and I think the, the chance to contribute to this, uh, this field from, you know, many different uh, backgrounds, right? Um, and I think it's at the intersection of those that we get the most uh, productive uh, contributions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the center, the Center for Neurotechnology, um, you know, one of the missions there is to bring people across uh, campus and across universities uh, together to, to contribute to this field and have that dialogue we, we need as this technology moves forward. I'm going to switch over to the uh, YouTube and just take a couple from there and then we'll come back and we've got questions from a couple of people who are going to ask directly. And I think Tony tethers back with another question. So Tony and Will will we'll get back to you in a minute. So um, we have a question from a member of Frank Robert in Australia and he asks, has anyone yet suggested applying massive multiple and multiple out phased array, or I should say massive, multiple in, multiple out phased array systems to generate thousands of spatially distinct receive or transmit beams to improve resolution? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's, it's one of the goals, I think, of the field is to, um, you know, that's it's MIMO, right? Multiple input, multiple output uh, kind of devices. And I think what you're getting at is maybe, you know, at some of those, um, the optical technologies that uh, people are looking at right now to both record and stimulate the brain, uh, you know, using optogenetics, for example. And so in, in, in those kinds of systems, I can see, uh, you know, some of the technologies that you're suggesting potentially being useful, at least in terms of the methodologies. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, as far as I, I know at this point, uh, you know, there's, there's not been a, um, a, uh, an effort where we, we're using uh, these particular types of technologies for, um, you know, for, from the optical side, right? Um, I think it's, it's not been, um, the co-processor concept that I talked about has not completely been explored uh, in, in terms of optical uh, technologies, uh, but, but very large scale recordings, optically as well as large scale, you know, uh, stimulation. Um, but it's an interesting idea, um, maybe, maybe in the future. Uh, number eight seven six one six one three two zero three six asks, <laughs> "What is the um, size and area of the ECOG patch that you're using?" Yeah, it's great. So yeah, I didn't uh, mention that uh, in the talk, but uh, ECOG, uh, you know, you typically uh, have um, electrodes. I mean, the one that's used clinically is like an eight by eight array that spans you know, considerable portion, it's in the millimeters uh, uh, scale. Uh, and it, it, it spans, uh, you know, it's a 64 electrodes and eight byte array that spans, you know, almost, I would say, uh, if you want to imagine uh, like, a, you know, a fourth of your brain or, you know, a sixth of your brain. And you can place in different locations uh, uh, depending on what the, uh, what the potential source of the seizure is. 
as you judged by what size the patch is, the actual electrode. Oh, the electrode itself. Uh, yeah, those are it depends. So there's uh, well, some that are like a millimeter uh, diameter, uh, or there could be the, the standard ones are slightly larger, but typically uh, in the millimeter scale, right? So uh, one millimeter to you know three millimeter millimeters. So it looked like they were spaced about three centimeters yeah. apart, something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're in the centimeter spacing apart, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, Paul Hess wants to know, did the experiments stimulate neurons in an on-off fashion or with a frequency of firing similar to what we saw when meeting neurons? Yeah, so um, I guess if you're looking at uh, delivering the electric current in terms of um, microelectrodes, electrodes that are penetrating, uh, in the brain, then uh, you typically have these pulses that go up and, and go down, like a biphasic pulse to keep the, the positive and negative charges kind of conserved. Uh, and so the, um, typically you, you can have multiple ways in which you can deliver stimulation. I showed one experiment where it was a one-to-one, -one where every spike had one uh, sort of biphasic pulse being delivered. Uh, but uh, if you're trying to emulate the, uh, the firing properties, right, the firing rates of neurons in the location you're stimulating, then it might be a frequency code. So there's a fixed amplitude, but then you have the frequency modulates according to what the output of the, uh, you know, the AI algorithm is or the neural network, the artificial neural network is. So there's m multiple ways in which you can modulate the output. And people have looked at changing the amplitude of the pulses that you're delivering or the frequency of the pulses. And each of those gives rise to you know, slightly different, you know, the, may, may give rise to different results. Uh, but it's a great question. I think it's still an open question as to how do you manipulate all the different parameters of stimulation to give you the sort of optimal uh, stimulation pattern. So I'm gonna to go to uh, Will Angel and then Tony, you're back on, so Will. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. And my thank name you. is Will Angel, I am a PSW member. Um, my question is, of the pathways that you've identified for future research and progress, as far as invasive versus non-invasive technologies, which of them do you think are most promising? And what are the big barriers in terms of technological development or funding that we need to really get these to a point where they can actually start being useful out of the lab? Yeah, I think, I mean, I get asked that question all the time. I think it's a, it's a hard one to answer in the sense that, uh, you know, it's hard to say which of the different leads that are out there right now will eventually lead to, you know, that, that uh, uh, sort of inflection in, in the curve and, and lead to all those commercial applications. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, EEG, which is what uh, a lot of the uh, right now sort of commercial entities that are applying it to, you know, non-medical applications they're looking at, um, it's still not, it's not definitely not robust enough to, you know, allow you to, replace like a um, you know, gaming joystick with, with EEG, right? Um, so EEG, I think, is, is interesting from a lab experimental proof of concept point of view, uh, but I don't see that as you know, leading to the breakthrough application. And similarly, uh, stimulation technologies like TMS, uh, you know, to some extent, you know, they're, um, uh, the fact that they're non-invasive and they can generate um, electrical perturbations uh, is, is uh, you know, it's good for some of these proof of concept demonstrations and maybe even some kind of therapies that uh, allow repetitive stimulation to potentially uh, you know, modulate some neural circuits. But again, I think the precision is not there for um, you know, the kinds of applications that we would eventually like to get to. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the, I would still say that the, um, the most promising approaches are still you know, the invasive ones, um, you know, the ones where you're recording from either the brain surface or from uh, the uh, you know, actual single neurons or um, populations of neurons inside the brain. Uh, which probably is why, you know, some of these companies have looked into that uh, kind of technology. Uh, ECOG, you know, the electro uh, electrocardiography, the brain surface recordings is something we've uh, looked at for humans. And it seems like it, uh, it's, it's a good um, sort of, um, I would say, trade-off there. It sort of optimizes that trade-off between invasiveness versus completely non-invasive uh, because, it, you know, it's close enough to the brain and you know, it's on the brain surface that it still gets you some good signals without the kind of artifacts you get from EEG when you move your head or, or speak and so on. But at the same time, it's not going inside the brain. So at least it optimizes that uh, trade-off. So I feel that's quite promising in terms of, um, you know, uh, using surf surface, brain surface signals, at least from the technology we have right now. Uh, optogenetics and optical technologies are the other big thing, right? So um, I think Facebook, for example, has, uh, has devoted a, a, you know, a big research 
group to just looking at optical uh, technologies uh, for recording only, um, right? The, uh, the stimulation part, I think people are only exploring in, in animals right now. And then finally, for non-invasive stimulation, a very promising technology is uh, focused ultrasound or FUS. And so focused ultrasound, you know, people uh, have been looking at that in animals and so on, um, in, in potentially also thing in humans. And it's a little bit, it's more precise than uh, TMS, the transferring magnetic stimulation. It's completely non-invasive. But uh, I think we're, the long-term effects are not known. Um, you know, if you're stimulating a brain tissue for a long time using focused ultrasound, you know, this cause, uh, it might cause damage, right? Um, so I think there's a there's that trade-off with stimulation technologies, uh, I think, in general. Um, so, so I think on the recording side, the bottom line is, you know, we, uh, ECOG seems to be a good um, sort of modality for recording and perhaps also stimulation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think we're, um, in terms of commercializing for non-medical applications, I think uh, um, I'm still not completely convinced any of these technologies are, are going to get us there, right? Um, we probably need some kind of breakthrough uh, in terms of the physics of recording and stimulation. So if, if Tony could be patient, I'm going to let him close out the question and answer period. I'm going <clears> to <throat> take a couple of questions from YouTube that our social media director has been kind enough to patch up to us. Um, and uh, one other person wants to ask a question, so I will, I will call on him in between, and then we'll have Tony have the last word. So a question from uh, Victoria Turnbull on YouTube chat. She says, you mentioned using error to train the AI to improve motor function. The cerebellum processes these kinds of errors as well. Are there changes in how the brain processes errors when an AI is used? Yeah, I think it's, um, that's an interesting analogy to, uh, you know, how does the brain optimize? Um, and in the case of the cerebellum, uh, there is definitely uh, you know, evidence for the fact that it's you know, using error signals as a way to optimize uh, the controller that it's implementing. Uh, and I think what we're doing here is to say, okay, the AI also needs some kind of an error signal to optimize itself. Uh, the, the big challenge that we found when we first started looking at this idea of, you know, can we use an artificial neural network to, uh, for example, help, um, you know, uh, figure out the best stimulation pattern for any current brain activity? What is the best stimulation pattern? The problem is we don't know what the best stimulation pattern is uh, because the best corresponds to the task that is an external goal, right? Such as reaching to an object or uh, saying I want to be the changing the mood scale or, you know, um, somebody might be uh, trying to speak a word uh, when they have a stroke. And so the, uh, the challenge that we, we wanted to address was if the error signal is external based on a physical therapy task or, a, you know, a, a task that the user wants to complete, can we propagate that error information back towards the neural network, this artificial intelligence neural network to change its connections, you know, the weights, the parameters of the artificial neural network so that it can optimize itself to generate better and better stimulation patterns to, uh, to minimize the error, right? To achieve that goal that it wants to achieve, the, the, the human wants to achieve. And that was the idea behind um, you know, that emulator network with the coprocessor network. So I had a, a figure there about the general purpose AI coprocessor. And so uh, we got around that problem by saying, okay, why don't we learn an emulator network that emulates that transformation from stimulation patterns to external behavior and then you can uh, use a back propagation algorithm, which is a very standard algorithm in deep learning and in AI. You can use that back propagation algorithm to back propagate the errors from the external uh, behavior all the way to the coprocessor network. And so that was uh, the, the reason why we're using the error signals. And so the analogy is, you know, it is similar to how the cerebellum uh, and even other parts of the brain may be optimizing errors. Uh, but here we're doing it from the point of view of AI optimizing the error signal externally, from external to the internal weights of the network. So another question from our YouTube viewers, uh, Anne has uh, put up for us a question from Neil on YouTube. What do you think about using this technology with animals like dolphins or octopus or pets? That's great. Yeah, I was waiting for that <laughs> question there. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, um, the, the question is, okay, what do, you, what do you want out of this kind of a system if you are going to um, use it, uh, you know, with, with a dolphin or, or a pet, right? So 
uh, some people say, hey, you know, can I communicate with my pet dog, right? Um, and I guess the question is, what does it mean to communicate uh, with, with an animal? I mean, you have to establish that kind of vocabulary that would allow you to communicate. In principle, I guess it is possible to build an interface that can record and then uh, essentially translate. So you basically have this translation problem, right, of uh, the vocabulary that the dog's brain has and the vocabulary we have. And so if you can solve that translation problem through some simple behaviors that you record from the animal, or I guess the mood of the animal, if you can somehow figure that out, then yes, maybe it is possible to form that connection or interpret that, uh, that particular behavior, right? Um, I think the, there's definitely a, um, a role for these devices uh, to understand the brain. So you can use a coprocessor as a way to uh, interrogate the brain. So you can basically send electrical stimulations, record, and see, okay, what was the result of the stimulation? You can reverse engineer the brain. So that could be really useful for reverse engineering the brains of dolphins or other animals. Uh, but if you want to go beyond that to a device that helps the, uh, like a, a pet uh, owner communicate with the pet, I think then there's an interesting issue of matching the vocabularies of the two brains and figuring out, okay, what is the goal there? I mean, in, in principle, it may be possible, but as far as I know, people have not attempted that. Let's take a question from Dan Lozier. And then we'll take a, two more from the YouTube, and then we'll call on Tony. So, Dan? Okay. Um, among the applications that you showed, the one that struck me as perhaps the most promising uh, in terms of the uh, uh, benefit for humanity is providing for uh, for, for um, prostheses for movement for patients or victims of uh, paralysis. But the example that you showed, uh, the uh, movement of the arm from the table to the mouth was not a direct smooth motion. It was jerky and, uh, and changed direction a lot. Um, and um, uh, so one of my questions is, um, what are the main obstacles to smoothing that out? Is it in the AI? Is it in the placement of the, of the sensors? Um, is it uh, the, um, uh, that, the, that the patient needs to spend more time practicing? Um, what would it take to, in a laboratory setting, have this woman pick up a hot cup of hot coffee and move it to her mouth and drink it. Um, now moving to a clinical setting, which is what you would need if you're going to apply this type of technology widely, um, one obvious thing is that the amount of equipment that was there was rather large. Uh, but also, I guess my question is, the placement of these sensors, if you know how to place it on one person, I mean, is, is this an individual thing or is it a group thing? If you know how to place the, do you have to, you have to study each patient individually to find out how to place the sensors in such a way as to get the smooth motion that you'd really like to have and that you would have to have in a practical, uh, you know, uh, situation? Great. Okay. So I think there are two questions. So the first one was, um, uh, so Dan wanted to know, you know, um, is there a way to make it um, make the movements more smooth when you're controlling a prosthetic? And uh, I think with the way people have tried to address that is to say, hey, you know, for many of the, the most important tasks, uh, you probably don't need to control every joint of the robot because that gets really quite, um, you know, uh, cognitively, you know, laborious. Uh, so uh, people have tried to record from areas of the brain that extract uh, the goal uh, of the movement. So for example, saying, okay, my goal is to reach to a particular location. And then let the robotics you know, algorithm do all the work of the smooth movement towards the, uh, the, the, uh, the object to pick up. And then, so essentially uh, having a hybrid control where the, the robot does a lot of the lower level uh, manipulation movements and so on. And the high level control is what the brain provides uh, for, for the device. And so that's one way to address uh, this issue of you know, um, low level control being jerky and, and maybe not something that you want the patient, you know, the, the person to control. Um, and allowing the, the underlying AI itself to take care of a lot of the, uh, the lower level control tasks. Um, and I think the second question you asked was, uh, 
you know, uh, how uh, personalized do we need to make uh, these these implants, right? Or how uh, how how vary uh, how varying are these implants? I mean, from each one patient to the other. And so, typically, what people have done is they they know which area to implant. I mean, typically, they target motor regions. If the goal is to control a prosthetic or control a cursor or some motor task, then they typically implant the motor cortex and maybe a few other cortices. And also sometimes the somatosensory cortex to get tactile information back to the brain uh, if they have sensors uh, on the robot. And so uh, typically the, there is some amount of um, planning that goes on. I mean, you, you, you can't, you, you do some amount of screening. So you, once you've implanted in a particular location, uh, you still have to do some screening to figure out, first of all, you know, how many of those uh, electrodes are really recording from neurons, which of those recordings are good. And then uh, after all that is when you start to then allow the person to train once you've got the mapping you know, uh, fixed and, and worked out. And then you can, you can then do a co-adaptation. So you allow the person to adapt to the mapping that you have between brain recordings and the robot for a while. And then you fix that and then you change the mapping itself. And that's the AI machine learning part. And so you kind of alternate between the person adapting and then the machine adapting. And that has seemed to be the way you can get it to uh, you know, help uh, in terms of getting the person to get better at controlling the device. Um, so I think it's, it's still, uh, this still requires some amount of, um, you know, uh, screening and work and calibration and so on. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it's not dramatically different from patient to patient in terms of where you need to implant because uh, you can map out the motor regions before you implant the device and then work with that uh, particular implanted device. So for that application, was that, um Hey, Dan, uh, was that, was we need, that? We need, Dan, we need to move on. I'm sorry. Yeah, feel free to email me. I think I'm happy to yeah, chat. Let, let me move on to uh, a couple of other questions and then Tony. So uh, Christina on the web, she has a really easy question for you. What's the anticipated timeline for prosthetics that are brain controlled to be on the market? Oh, okay. Easy question you said. <laughs> um, the easy I answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think nobody knows, but if you believe, uh, uh, I think some of the people in the industry, I think they would say, you know, it's going to happen next year, right? But uh, I think there's several issues. One is, you know, the, the, if it is something like an implanted device, like the one that Neuralink is developing, then it has to go through the FDA and that takes time uh, for approval and so on. Um, I think also, the whole risk versus benefits trade-off in terms of, you know, once it's implanted um, and if it's really going to be in the market for somebody to take home um, and then use at home as a prosthetic device, uh, I think that, that that part is not as robust yet. It still requires somebody in the lab to make all the adjustments and so on. So we need to get around the whole calibration and, and uh, make sure it works from day to day and not require somebody from the lab or clinic to be there at home, right? I think those are the parts that are being worked out. So I don't see that happening in the next, you know, two, three years, but maybe in the, in the, in the 10 year time frame, right? So um, Tony might say, hey, that's too long, but, uh, but that, that's kind of, um, I think Elon Musk has uh, said in his press conference for his company that they're trying to get approval within the next year, but I think now it's probably going to be difficult to meet that deadline, right? So I would say at least a few years from now. Right, before. We, all, we all know with Elon, if whatever his timeline is, we'll divide by three, but he'll eventually get it. <laughs> Well, doing three years is great, actually, if you can do it in three so, years. Uh, with apologies to other people who have questions that we didn't get to, and I think many of them have been addressed in some part anyway. Uh, let's, let's take Tony Tether and let him have the last question. Tony. All right. Well, you know, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to, to have that. I, I guess I have uh, three things. One, first of all, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sci-fi fan. I mean, I, I've gotten my best ideas from reading science fiction. And I always uh, looked at DARPA as DARPA was the place where science fiction became reality. And when people interviewed me, uh, for me, I would always ask them somewhere along the court, do you read science fiction? If they said no, uh, it was a little hard, hard job to, to bring them in. <laughs> but I, I, I really do believe that, that that's a place like DARPA is that kind of a place. But I see two paths that, that we haven't really talked about. First of all, there are billionaires around today. I mean, multi-billionaires, and of course, Elon's one of them. And these people are getting to that age where they realize that they are going to soon come to an end. And I'm sure they don't want to come to that end. So one way to not come to that end is to build a mechanical robot and have your 
basically either think of it as a head transplant onto that onto that mechanical body and it could nothing it's all plumbing right it's all plumbing from there and and basically from your brain's viewpoint it has another ways with effectors that just like are and, and, and the, the person goes on so i do see that happening and i'm sure that these billionaires are thinking about it and there's no fda that gets in their way okay <laughs> I mean that's that's uh, but but so I, I think that's a path, okay. And I'm I would not be surprised if there aren't some of these guys who are spending money uh, looking at uh, how to do that. Okay? Uh, the other the other part is that IBM uh, didn't create has created a memory, and it was a DARPA program in the very beginning, uh, which basically has the same a number of, of cells in a human in the same volume. It also has a coprocessor now on it, and that is all the same as a human. And the question is, how do you make this this thing learn? Now, somebody may be able to figure out. And if I'm, well, I've got this thing that's my brain. Can I somehow map my brain and transfer uh, that mapping into this into this other uh, mechanical uh, mecha where, where it's not it's not organic, but you can transfer it there. And if I did, would it be me? Uh, you know, again, there's no FDA that gets involved in them doing that. And I would first do it with a dog and stuff like that. I mean, if I were back in DARPA, I would be doing things like this. You know, uh, but but that's where I see those two things going. So I I do believe that that you know, uh, if you look at look at ten to twenty years from now is a long time. I mean, you know, if you look at dub the doubling of knowledge that is going on, ten to ten to the twenty years is it's a long, long time, and, and I do believe that those are two paths that I see are, are very likely. And I guess, uh, you know, with that, I, uh, it's sort of like, uh, good night. <laughs> have, have good dreams. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a great way to, uh, I think. Great like cruise uh, miles. Yes. Uh, and, and you'll be the person that does it, and we'll remember you. <laughs> well, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> well, I, I hate to end it here, uh, you know, but we... We're all time limited at this point, maybe when we're uploaded or we uh, have our brains in a mechanical <laughs> device, we won't be worrying about time because we won't be aging. <laughs> but thank you very, very much for a very interesting talk. Um, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll keep in touch and you have a rain check. Yeah, th thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was great to answer all the questions and thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me as part of PSW. I look forward to seeing you uh, in DC. <laughs> yes, or I'll see you in Seattle. Ah, Seattle, yeah, please. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Before we adjourn, there are a few closing items to attend to. Uh, PSW depends on members and sponsors. If you are a member and have not yet paid your dues, uh, please do so. If you have paid your dues, or even if you haven't, please consider making an additional donation, sponsoring a lecture, sponsoring a lecture series, and volunteering to help carry out the society's activities. If you're not a member, please join. You can apply for membership via the PSW website. You just need to go to the home page and click on the join button and it will bring up a series of forms for you to fill out and your uh, application will be transmitted automatically to PSW and will be acted upon quickly. The only requirements for membership are a genuine interest in science and a willingness to abide by the society's rules and enjoy and respect its traditions. Uh, please contact membership director Lloyd Mitchell and or corresponding secretary Robin Taylor. If you have questions regarding membership, contact information is on the website. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, contributions and tax are tax deductible to the extent permitted by the law in the IRS. Our next speaker 
will be Henrik Christensen at the 2423rd meeting on 26 June 2020. We anticipate that we will be holding our meeting by Zoom and will be streaming to YouTube. He will be talking about contextual robotics, making intelligent robots that serve society. Henrik is Professor of Engineering and Director of the Contextual Robotics Institute at the University of California, San Diego. The lecture is sponsored by PSW Science member Erica Kane. The Falls Lecture Series is being put together as we speak. Thus far, we have four speakers scheduled or committed. On October 23rd, Kang Kwan Ni of Harvard and Harvard MIT will be speaking on her remarkable work visualizing the quantum states of molecules. On the 6th of November, Wendy Friedman, professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago, will be speaking on measuring the Hubble constant and the fate of the universe. The lecture is sponsored by PSW member Bob Terry and the two other speakers who have made commitments to speak in the fall are Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist for Food Safety at the USAID, and he will be speaking on Golden Rice. The lecture is sponsored by PSW member John Orovac, and Wyatt Korf, who is Director of Project Teams at the Genelia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and he will be talking on the unique project team approach to research that's instituted HHMI Genelia and has led to uh, work that has won uh, Nobel Prizes. So please note that PSW is run entirely by volunteers and we'd like to give credit to the people who worked on tonight's Zoom meeting, James Hewlin, who prepared and read the minutes, and the team who handled the live chat questions Robin Taylor, who is the Zoom and YouTube director and also does a lot of work behind the scenes to get equipment set up and work. So let's all hear it for them. I'd also like to thank our general committee, Mark Clampin, Robin Taylor, James Seelan, Brett Magrum, Connor Nixon, Jared McQueen, Anne McQueen, Lloyd Mitchell, and myself. And finally, we want to thank our volunteers, Savannah Crawford, Noah Block, Laurel Keane and Robert Thompson, and especially we want to give double congratulations to volunteer Savannah Crawford, A. Savannah, who graduated this year with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from George Mason University, is going straight on to her PhD in Mathematics. So, hoo <laughs> We are so happy. Thank you, Savannah, for sharing this with us. And thank you all for tuning in. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting to your private social hours. <laughs>